Good yeah. enough. Can you hear yourself yeah. well? Okay. Um, let me just adjust this quickly. Sure. Okay, so um, this is meant to be somewhat candid. So <laughs> It's a little hard to be candid in the setup, but all right. Is it? Yeah. Well, I meant just for the nature of the conversation anyway. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. One second. Sure. Where are you in the program at this point? Um, I'm in my, I student teach this fall. Oh, wonderful. So I'm taking a methods, the final methods course right now, and I'm lucky enough to fill the rest of my schedule with... Uh, Things you want. Films about painting, yeah, <laughs> films about paintings with Nathan Peck. So oh, nice. Very nice. That's been fun. Yeah. And he's allowed me some room to uh, be creative with my assignments. Oh, good. So it's been very fun. He is a very creative person. And, Certainly. And has done wonders for our students, I think. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Myself yeah, included. Good. Very much. Um, <clears throat> so, just for the context for the listeners, can you tell us a little bit about just who you are these days? <laughs> these days? These days and in general, okay. yes. Okay. Um, well, after about 35 years of teaching, I retired. Uh, I live in Villa Park, not too far from here. Um, and I have four grand boys uh, and two, all, all five of my kids are now married. So that's pretty exciting. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah very uh, good. And they all have jobs. <laughs> oh, beautiful, even better. <laughs> yeah. Certainly. And I have one daughter who's a teacher, uh, first grade, uh, in a private school in Evanston. And uh, she and I are thick as thieves because we uh, discuss teaching all the time. And so I hear all the stories about her children and all that stuff. Oh, wow. Um, it sort of gives her husband a little bit of break because she can talk to me when she's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> unwinding. Seems yeah, that teachers certainly. need to unwind at the end of the day. I suppose so. It's a lot of, um, a lot of input, yeah. you know, a little bit of output. Um, okay, we should also mention that we're at St. Xavier University mm -hmm. in Chicago, which is where you were a professor yeah. for many years. 27. 27 years, that's right. Mm. So, in doing what little bit of research I did about you, as, as opposed from um, our time in class together, I know... So the things, the things the world knows is your education, your, your contributions to curriculum and your contributions, of course, here at the university. But the goal of sort of collecting these interviews and these conversations is one, both for me to reflect upon my influences, but also to use these conversations in the future for my future students to reflect upon and hear just the arc of people's careers and where they come from as individuals and how, how they found purpose and success in their work and how they you know, find themselves to be Doing what they do. Somewhat satisfied in the work they do, yeah. you know, and, uh, and to want to continue to contribute to it and add to it like you've done. So if you could, can you tell us a little bit about growing up and sort of what brought you into education? And, but also first, just some background about you as an individual. Yeah. Um, I was born in Connecticut. Uh, we lived there for the first 10 years of my life. My dad died when I was eight, so my mom found a girlfriend, and she, she had two daughters. Her husband had died in the Korean War, and so we decided to go with them to California, where she had a house. And so we bought a, <laughs> a 1949 Chrysler limousine oh, wow. and loaded the two families and our collie dog into the car and drove for... 20 days across the United States, stopping at various parks and things like that. Oh, starting wow. with Niagara Falls and ending in Death Valley. And finally, by the time we reached L.A., 
um, my brother and I didn't get along with the two girls, and my mom thought maybe since she had a friend in L.A. who ran a chicken farm, we'd stay there for a, a bit, and then she'd resettle up in the Santa Clara Valley where, my, where her sister lived. Okay, and so wow. we ended in Santa Clara, where I went to high school and uh, was a swimmer uh, with the Santa Clara Swim Club, which was pretty good, cool. A lot of mm-hmm. Olympic swimmers from there, so I wasn't the best, but I had a good time. Right. Um, and then uh, Vietnam happened, and uh, so I decided rather than be drafted, I would enlist so that I could choose my, they call it MOS, my job, Mm -hmm. and uh, ended in Army Intelligence, which um, a friend told me was the Jewish infantry (laughs) because it was basically desk jobs, and I thought, well, that would be just about right for me. Uh, And then was stationed in Washington, D.C. when... um, fell in love and married the daughter of a colonel and he didn't like me and so when it came time for transfer he helped transfer me to Vietnam which I was hoping to avoid Uh, and he also changed my records so that I arrived in Vietnam looking like a killer soldier and Mm -hmm. so a program called the Phoenix Project took me in as uh, a killer, and um, I could type. That was what I did best. (laughs) Uh, Weapons were not my thing, but according to my records, I was jungle warfare trained, and I had a small arms specialty and was good with explosives. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. (laughs) A whole different person. (laughs) Wow. Yes, very much. So... um, And in Vietnam, I saw some stuff that uh, I had to uh, help take children off a school bus that had been blown up Mm -hmm. and choose which ones we could save and which ones we had to let go. And uh, it was just me and the medic. It was pretty awful. And then I had to make a decision to let a child who'd been blown up die because we couldn't have saved her. And so a couple of times I had decisions about children that were very painful to me. Absolutely. I... So when I came back from Vietnam, I was a little bit jaundiced, I guess is the word. I uh, didn't want to get a job, didn't like anything that was going on. and So I took uh, five years and went to England and was a gardener caretaker in, a, in England for five years. And then when I came back, the only thing that interested me was teaching. Uh, I'd had some good experiences in high school with a teacher named Miss Dosey who looked after me and made sure I got through high school. Otherwise, I probably would have not made it. Mm -hmm. I was not exactly everybody's favorite student. (laughs) Um, But Miss Dosey took me under her wing and made sure I knew how to read well enough to survive. So I thought, well, I could probably do that for somebody as a teacher and would feel good about myself. Absolutely. So I had already gotten a master's degree in American history and um, went back and got a second master's degree at National Lewis in teaching reading and did that for 10 years in a middle school. That was in Lincolnwood? And... um, Middle school has its own drains. It's uh, the kids want more of you than you might be able to give, and I didn't have clearest boundaries, so a lot sure. of overlap of kids wanting my time and effort. And, Absolutely. Um, so there was an opening here for a reading diagnostician. That was back in the day that if you didn't know how to read, you had a medical problem by the model we were using. So I was a diagnostician and could um, determine where your flaws were in reading and what you might need to remediate. And I ran a reading clinic in Pacelli Hall in the basement. Um, 
did that for a couple of years, and then uh, learned about the field-based master's program, and that was where I spent the next 20 years in that program as an instructor for teachers, driving all over the state of Illinois and doing field programs. So that's the history. Wow, yeah, that's the, the synopsis, I suppose, yeah. the arc of everything. Um, so, obviously, you were drawn very heavily to teaching given the circumstances of your life, but pulling apart everything you just shared with us, can you tell us about the first 10 years of your life growing up in Connecticut, what it, what it was like for you? Also, I'm sorry, what year were you born? 46. 1946. Yes. So 1946, you were born in Connecticut. Yeah. And I had one brother. One brother. Yeah, who was a little bit older. Mm -hmm. uh, and we lived on, we rented houses in the beach area of Westport, which uh, is kind of sort of a famous beach area f for people who want to escape New York. Um, but as a local boy, um, I worked in the Clam House, which was a barn where we sold fresh clams and lobsters and crabs and things like that. And uh, it was run by an old retired sea captain named Captain Allen. And uh, he would sit in a rocker and let me do the business. Mm -hmm. um, and we're talking at five. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it was kind of a big deal. I could open clams with a knife and uh, could convince the little old ladies that they should pay full price for everything. And uh, usually did pretty well. And nice. uh, I did that during the summer months. And during the winter, they uh, I was in school. After my father died, I was pretty angry. I can, yeah. And... Um, basically disrupted classes and managed to get suspended in fourth, third grade for 16 days from school for punching the principal. Oh, wow. Which was probably not a good plan. No. <laughs> um, in hindsight, yeah, not a good plan right. anyway. Uh, and he called the police to take me home. Wow. My mom worked as a secretary for special ed uh, in the same district. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so she probably got a, a, a word pretty quickly. Yeah. yeah. Oh, boy. Um, so I was tutored by special ed folks from then on, kind of. Um, mm -hmm. I went to school fourth grade in Connecticut, and then we moved to California. Yeah. By fifth grade. Yeah. What did your dad do for work? He owned an extermination company. Interesting. Yeah. So uh, he had graduated from Northwestern. Oh, wow. Uh, what did he study? Law. Law, wow. Um, but by the time, um, by the time he had us, we were his third family. And uh, he was running his own business. Unfortunately, the last couple of years of his life, he wasn't t too focused, and uh, he died of drug addiction, morphine addiction. Hmm. And uh, his own co-worker embezzled all the funds out of the company. So my mom got the debts instead of a profit. Oh, my gosh. So when we moved to California, she was also broke. Hmm. So it was kind of a tough move. Certainly, that's hard to imagine starting over in that way yeah. in a very dramatic fashion with two young children. Two near teenagers. <laughs> two near teenagers, <laughs> yeah. I suppose, probably worse, yeah. really. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so then what year was it that you moved to California? 56. In 56. So I was 10. You were 10 years old. And what was life like in California then for your family and you? Uh, well, we started in a place called Rancho Rinconada which was a Eichler home uh, housing track. Okay. So most of the neighbors were in the same financial boat as we were. Um, and 
very soon my mom thought this was not the best place for us, so she found another house in Santa Clara that was a little, little more upscale. Uh, she was working by then as an executive secretary for Macy's department stores and uh, held that job the whole time I was in high school and college and the army and all of that. And I think it was uh, about the time I got out of the army that she also left Macy's because they had replaced her with an executive. And she was put in collections, which was not something she wanted to do. I think I remember you mentioning the story in class before. I believe she was, should have been the favorite for the promotion, and she was passed Correct. over. Correct. Yeah. And a man got the job. <laughs> so, um, and so what were your high school years like then? What were you doing? I know you, were, you said you were a swimmer. What other things were you into, involved in, or in, curious about yeah, anyway? Um, well, I performed in two musicals. Um, okay, theater then. Pardon me? Some theater yeah, in your yeah, background? A little very bit. Cool. Uh, I wasn't very good, but it was fun. Mm -hmm. um, one of them was also included dance, and that was pretty amusing. I had to learn to dance, and then when we got on stage, my partner didn't come through the line like she was supposed to. So I ended up dancing by myself, and she danced by herself on the other end of the, of the stage. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, we were supposed to be in partners, but oh well. <laughs> yeah, a little misstep. Yeah. <laughs> um, that was for the main performance. We blew it, but otherwise we did pretty well. Um, let's see, what else was I into? I, my senior year, I ran cross country. I didn't do great, but... Uh, 23rd in the state for my division, which wasn't too bad. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, let's see, I think Spanish was a disaster. That was the lowest grade I got. I got a D in Spanish. Uh, the other courses, algebra I had to repeat because Mr. Corbellini and I didn't get along. And uh, so I took it again in summer. And in summer school, I had a young... Santa Clara University uh, teacher who was new to the business, and I excelled with him, and that was great. I got an A plus. Oh, very good. You guys connected yeah, well. It was, he was uh, pretty amusing and challenged us a lot, and it was, it was good business. So we we did a. Uh, he was one of those teachers that inspired, you know. Yes, certainly. Yeah. Um, so I managed to get both my algebra classes and a geometry class behind me, but when it came to calculus, I bailed about halfway into it. I thought, ah, it's not working for me. <laughs> <laughs> so I knew I wasn't going to be math or science. <laughs> um, and my year after, let's see, my senior year, I started working at McDonald's, and by summer, I was an assistant manager at our local McDonald's. And I did that through my first year at San Jose State. And in San Jose State, for some reason, I took Russian and failed it. <laughs> um, and Do you remember any of it? <laughs> Stravsvichi. <laughs> That's about it. What is this? Hello. And yeah. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Because it was a five-hour class, and I withdrew from the university um, for mononucleosis. Mm. Um, and he didn't forgive me. I had a five-hour F when I came back to the university to oh, make no. up for my GPA. But uh, by the time I was through, uh, somehow or another, the records read that I had a 4.0 So wow. <laughs> after I came back from the service. So, Very yeah. good. Uh, and I went through a program called the New College, and it was a seminar program, and it made all the difference in the world for me. Um, there was a lot of reading and discussion, basically, kind of like I wanted to run my classes here. Certainly. Uh, and it was, uh, we even selected some of our own curriculum. It was a pretty exciting program. It was very flexible. They borrowed all the best teachers from the university to put them together to keep 
all us crazies. Uh, it was basically set aside for what they considered the radical contingent of the university, and people were hand-selected to be in this oh, program. Wow. Oh, That sounds very exciting. Yeah. And uh, I got to speak against the war at Vienna, uh, against the war at Stanford University um, as a guest speaker for a uh, sort of a activist program mm -hmm. and uh, 3,000 students in the audience that was pretty freaky that was my and how old are you then? I just finished uh, I was in my junior or senior year at San so 22, 23 yeah, somewhere around there yeah mm -hmm. um, I cried I got them to cry it was pretty good <laughs> wow very good yeah I'm, I mean I've had you I've heard you lecture in class, you're very compelling. I can't imagine when you're talking about something you're so passionate about as well. Um, so after coming back to San Jose State then, you, did you continue to study Russian or you, you switched your major to, uh, what is it, um, epistemology? Epistemology. Epistemology. Yeah, how do we, how we know what we know. How do we know what we know? What is knowledge and how do we know? Yeah, exactly. Um, basically, it, they just assembled some courses that I could take. That, so um, some of it was my own design. Mm -hmm. um, the program was pretty flexible, and so I did a lot of reading of um, sort of self-help books and things like that. Having come back from Vietnam, I was a little strange. Um, I can only imagine. Yeah. And uh, I was married. Uh, my wife and I had gotten married before I went to Vietnam. We'd been married one month. So when I came back, I was a slightly different person because of the requirements of survival. Absolutely. And uh, so our marriage was strained a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. um, we we so hung in there. You were 18 when you went to Vietnam, or you were 19 or 20 or so? By then I was 20... Yeah, 2021. Mm, so, and, you, and then you had been in the service for some time, and it wasn't until this colonel. Right. Who? My father-in-law. Your father-in-law, right. Wow. Yeah. And um, I learned just a few years ago, uh, my first wife phoned me mm -hmm. and said that she had just been at her father's deathbed, and he had uh, admitted that he had gotten me sent to Vietnam and had doctored my files so that he was his hope was that I wouldn't come back it's kind of Shakespearean it was a little bit scary it's terrifying <laughs> to hear that someone yeah uh, um, and I was teaching at the time and of course I, my personal life always leaks into my teaching and uh, I had a couple of guys uh, teachers that were teaching down on the uh, where were we we were out in Alito, Illinois, which is near the Mississippi. And my father-in-law had died in Missouri, and they wanted to take a field trip down there so we could piss on his grave. But we'd, we didn't do that, actually. <laughs> but it sounded like a good idea. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Instead, we had some beers and let it slide. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Um, so that must have been incredibly difficult. Uh, well, I'm sure there are no words to properly describe your time overseas. Um, Actually, I'm writing about it now. Are you? Uh, thanks to Dr. Bathgate here. Okay, I had him as professor he, as well. He uh, pushed on me and said, you know, you've got a lot of stories in you. And, right. And uh, you're retired. It might give you something to focus on. Absolutely. So I've got uh, 45 snippets now about my experience in Vietnam, and it's, it's coming easily as a story because it's a year so it's you know a time frame is all set up and mm -hmm. I just pursuing it uh, historically what yeah, happened absolutely sort of just documentary style yeah, but sort of, also autobiographical I, I would call it a memoir memoir okay. and uh, and he reads it and gives me feedback and so mm -hmm. I rearrange things and, you know do that it's kind of fun and then I have two other readers who are friends who are very excited about me doing this, so it keeps me energized. I I will also champion your efforts because I know how I know how often people who go through war don't like to speak about it 
and it very often goes, it gets brushed over. So, which is another reason that I was excited to speak with you today, just to hear your perspective on the world and everything. But those things in particular, which seem to come around all too often, conflicts, and especially firsthand experience, scares the, the living hell out of me. <laughs> and, and I don't know what it is about the nature of the world, but they seem to forget how Absolutely. dreadful war can be. Yeah. You know, and I have only read about it and seen movies. And that's good enough. That's all you mm -hmm. want to do, I think. I think yeah. so. That's as far as it should go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I suppose it's good material for movies, but um, none of my children wanted to go to war, so that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about um, when the conflict was happening, and you said that instead of being waited to draft, you in enlisted. Was that an effort to? to sort of circumvent being drafted into a more, um, more dangerous scenario, did you feel compelled at all to go to, to enlist? Uh, I got a letter from Uncle Sam mm -hmm. saying that I was selected mm. and I could wait until they drafted me, which was a month, or I could find an MOS that I wanted and volunteer. Okay. So I became regular army, which was... There was uh, there were kind of two designations, either regular army or uh, drafted. And drafted, you pretty much took whatever job they wanted you to do. Mm -hmm. But when you enlisted, you got to make some selections. And I talked to my mom's boss, who had been in the army during uh, World War II, and he had been in army intelligence, and he said it was much more interesting and less combat-oriented and more um, planning-oriented. Mm -hmm. So I thought that sounded challenging. Uh, the only thing is that there were a whole series of fiascos in the, when I got in the service. They lost my records and put me in Baltimore, Maryland in a training center for a year unattended. Nobody knew what I was there for. So I spent a year in Baltimore playing, waiting for somebody to say, you can't play anymore, you gotta do something else. Uh, and it took them about a year to find me again. Interesting. Yeah. So I was at the in School for Intelligence, but I didn't have my clearance, so I couldn't, I wasn't allowed to take any courses. So I was in a holding company. And uh, basically every time a new batch of guys would come, I'd make new friends and we'd go off and explore the city. <laughs> I, I know all the historic sites and things like that. It was kind of fun. I can imagine as a young man <laughs> hanging out in Baltimore for a while. Uh, but then once the, I got trained, they sent me to Washington, D.C. I did background investigations. Uh, for instance, I would see your next-door neighbors and find out if you were a loyal citizen by asking a series of questions. And then I could report that according to your neighbors or your... They interviewed my Sunday school teacher, which was pretty amazing since I hadn't been to Sunday school since I was 14, but um, they still interviewed my, my Sunday school teacher and a few of my school teachers decided I was good enough to be trained, so they sent me through training. And then after being in, ba in Washington for a year... Um, they offered me the opportunity to become a special agent. So I went back to Baltimore, took agent training, and it was then that my orders to come back to D.C. were superseded by orders from the commanding officer of Army Intelligence, who happened to be my father-in-law's golf partner. Uh, that would be going to Vietnam. And because my father-in-law was also in intelligence, uh, he managed to somehow get to my files. And when I arrived in Vietnam, the intake officer, a young lieutenant, welcomed me as a soldier and said, I see by your records that you're a serious soldier. And they had six years of training in 
my records. I hadn't been in the Army six years yet, but there were six years of training, and I tried to say, this is a mistake, and they all laughed. But, yeah, nice try, soldier. Yeah. Nice try, <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. And then how long were you overseas? Just 11 months. 11 months. It's supposed to be a year, but I got uh, a month off so I could start it as soon as they stayed again. I'd gotten accepted, and uh, they called it an early out. So I actually served four years and, I don't know, something like nine months mm-hmm. in the service. Wow. That's a very long time. Yeah. For a young man. And I made it to E6, sergeant, staff sergeant, but got demoted when I told a lieutenant because, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm sure he deserved it. <laughs> the bastard. I, I threatened to frack him, which probably was not a good thing. Uh, well, yeah. I'm sure you had plenty justification. Well, one of the things he did that amused me was he took all of the files out of our file drawers and mixed them all up and said that he wanted me to spend the next few days straightening them out again. And I told him to go fuck himself. Yeah, <laughs> rightfully so. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure there was a l- many uh, petulant things like that happening yeah. with commanding officers. Well, he didn't like the fact that I was sent as a second because he had not been successful at the job that we were supposed to be doing. So I was I was making friends with all the people that he had alienated uh, mm. in the community. And I was basically being successful at the job that he was supposed to be doing. Wow, so he was jealous, to, say and, it, to put it angry, lightly. Yeah. And angry, yeah. certainly. Yeah. Uh, so shortly thereafter, after I'd been demoted, uh, I got transferred to my own unit where I was the only person in charge. So um, that was challenging in itself because I had uh, 40 Cambodian mercenaries that I targeted on uh, so-called political types. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we did night operations and uh, violated some of the military rules because I was the only American out in the field at the time and we weren't ever supposed to go by ourselves. But um, my boss had to assign me a ranger who uh, worked with me. He wasn't American, he was Cambodian, but uh, he was pretty talented. So we did night operations and we... I would call them assassinations. Um, I didn't have to do the killing. I just had to be there with my men. My men mm-hmm. did the killing. And they usually took ears to show that they had killed people. And they would wear their ears pinned on safety pins down the front of their shirts. Um, it was pretty dramatic, very different from what I experienced in suburbia <laughs> um, yeah I cannot even imagine um, it sort of leaves me speechless honestly to hear about it because um, there's those anecdotal things like I said from books and from movies that you collect in your brain as a, you know as you take them in but hearing your perspective it's a, a bit overwhelming and it was uh, for me the whole time I was terrified absolutely. all the time I can't even imagine the level of, I just can't even imagine it. And I'm grateful that I haven't, honestly. So one of the students in class, when I was telling the story, Mm -hmm. said to me, and you took acting before you went into the service? And I said, yes. And Mm -hmm. he said, well, you had to spend a whole year acting because you weren't the person they wanted you to be. And I, I thought, that's true. Interesting. Yeah, and it gave me kind of a whole different sense because I, I had, you were, I had to be a tough guy. Yeah. And I had to call that up from books and things that I had read. Right. Um, so you found yourself masquerading as a as a tough guy. As a tough yeah. guy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And there were a few times where I had to stand firm against crazy Americans, 
as well as the Vietnamese. Yeah. Well, tensions are high. Everyone around you is probably also on edge and terrified themselves, whether they would admit it to anyone else. So short tempers and yeah. I'm sure violence amongst yep. your peers was common. It was common. And because I, because I was the only enlisted man doing this job that mostly officers did, they took my rank away, so I wore no rank, which irritated the heck out of all the regular army people because, you know, who is he? What does he get? The hierarchy. Yeah. 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 yeah so. uh, it was a complicated mess. <laughs> uh, yes, I certainly can't even imagine. Um, so I'm certain you felt great relief coming back to California. I did. Uh, and we did our junior year abroad, um, and I lived on the GI Bill. And uh, my wife and I traveled all over Europe for our junior year. Very uh, good. All, all, the, whole, the whole year, which was pretty cool. Um, and then when we came back to California, uh, I was, I'd gone back to Westport to visit my godmother, and uh, a friend of hers had a house in England and asked if we'd care to caretake. And I thought that was a perfect yeah. sort of way to calm down. Right. Kind of just have a sense of peace. Yeah. Um, so then that was after your senior year at San Jose State? Yes. And five years in England. What were you, aside from gardening and uh, reading and things, what were you, what were you doing in England? Um, the woman who owned the house was a uh, uh, instructor at the United Nations. So she, and she was a Boston blue blood uh, well-connected, had been in um, OSS during the war, uh, was friends with uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, um, had quite a history herself, so she would entertain but not be there. So I would go to the train station and pick up whoever she was entertaining and keep them for as long as they wanted to stay at the house. and. Uh, drive them places and uh, shop and cook and do all the things that she would be doing if she were there. Mm -hmm. And then she would come periodically and uh, we would, it would be a full house, you know, we'd have guests and her and us. And, uh, so there was a lot of time entertaining the ambassador from Sierra Leone, the president of Ramco, Corporation, wow. the head of Yale's med school, uh, you know, people of of some rank in the world. Certainly, yeah. That was kind of amusing. Oh, I bet having dinner with these. Yeah, driving them around, these sort talking of to them. Yeah. Yeah, as regular people, probably yeah. their guards a little down. Yeah. And you're sharing. The ambassador meal. from Sierra Leone was hilarious. He was uh, obviously African, um, mm -hmm. and he wore a raggedy overcoat so that he would not be disturbed when he was on the train because people would think he was, you know, yeah. yeah. Noble. Yeah, well, no, they, they, they think he was poor. Oh, well, yeah, yeah but to avoid them thinking yeah. otherwise, yeah. Um, but he had graduated first from uh, Oxford in medicine. And wow. um, underneath, he had a pinstripe suit all the time. And it was a very fancy one. And so he was quite a character. And, and yeah, uh, sounds like he it. spent quite a bit of time with me, and he was, we enjoyed each other a lot. That very was good. fun. Yeah. Um, and he showed me that racism was alive and well in England, which uh, was a little bit disappointing. He, the people would be rude to him until he pulled rank on them and you know, shifted right. to his real accent and, you know. Yeah, sort of a F you to them yeah. in a way. Yeah. And so this was the late 70s now, or early 80s? Mid 70s. Mid 70s? Yeah. yeah. Then I came back to University of Oregon, mm -hmm. took a master's, finished there at 79. 
I must ask, what sort of music were you listening to in these days, in the mid-70s? Well, it's interesting because I got to see Bob Marley live in London, oh, wow. which was wow. at a club. So, I mean, right up close. People. Yeah, yeah. It was wonderful. Uh, and I was with a whole series of Africans from Sierra Leone. So oh. I was kind of in an interesting crowd, too. So. Right, immersed in the culture. Yeah, it was wonderful. Very cool. Um, so reggae was a big thing. Uh, what else was I listening to? The Rolling Stones, of course. Mm -hmm. um, I had seen them in Washington, D.C., uh, you know, I, I kind of wanted to get that T-shirt that said, but I saw the best bands, you know, because mm -hmm. um, my wife had worked for uh, Sid Bernstein, who was a, a producer, a music producer. And so she introduced me to uh, the Everly Brothers and okay. Bob Dylan. and uh, We had dinner with Bob Dylan. Did yeah, you really? He, he, he oh, was wow. with Sid and... So he joined us and brought Bob with him. That was kind of weird. I didn't have anything to say to him at all. <laughs> and then wow. my wife was good friends with the Young Rascals. Wow. And they were kind of a house band where she hung out. Uh, so uh, when we got married, she introduced me, and uh, we were pretty, pretty fun. We'd go every night to the club. Uh, and then uh, her roommate, dated Howard Kalin, the lead singer of the Turtles. Okay. And so he stayed with us. Interesting. Yeah, so it was kind of an exciting time. And yeah, absolutely. Uh, that was probably, er let's see, when was that? It was just before I went to Vietnam. All that stuff happened. Wow. Yeah. So I kept listening to that kind of music. Dylan was a big thing in my life. Very good. I'm a huge Dylan fan. I sort of embody his lyrics and words yeah. in some way. Yeah. Um, wow, very cool. I'm always curious what people are listening yeah. to in their early adolescence, or not early, you know, their... Young years, yeah. Their young years, absolutely. Yeah, I'm still a rock fan, and my wife plays classical, and I, I'm okay with that, but when yeah. she's not in the car, I've got rock, and she claims I'm... Uh, what does she tell me I'm... I must be deaf. I, I do wear hearing aids now because I did do some damage to my ears, but mm. I don't know if it was rock and roll or guns. But Well, probably a combination. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you crank it. In the I do, is what yeah. You're yeah. Well, you should, you know, put the windows down. Yeah. She asked me, Absolutely. has Helen Keller been in the car with you? <laughs> uh, well, that's, that's very interesting. Um, okay, so now you're back in Oregon, and this is when... You, this is, you studied American studies at University of Oregon, yeah. and I'm guessing that's somewhat social science, somewhat humanities. Yeah, it was basically um, history and literature of the West. Okay. Um, I was kind of interested in the West, and so I took a lot of courses in Western uh, settlement uh, and our interaction with the Native Americans and things like that took a number of anthropology classes. It was, again, one of those programs that I designed myself. So uh, You got lucky yeah, that way. Yeah, uh, kind of like you with uh, Nathan. Um, I, I had a few people at the University of Oregon, and actually three professors who adopted me uh, come by the house and smoke weed with me and, <laughs> um, and then you know pretend we were normal people at, at right. the university. Right. Uh, Uh, one was literature, one was history, and one was anthropology. And so I took all their courses that they offered. And then I had a few other people that you know I could take courses with. And then finally, uh, didn't know what I wanted to do, finished it there. And I got a uh, second uh, stipend from the Army, which gave me a little more freedom because I, they as a soldier returning, they will do training for job. Mm -hmm. So uh, they decided they were training me to be a professor. And so they supplied the money for uh, there and for my beginning at Northwestern. Wow, very yeah. good. So after, after the University of Oregon, I got accepted at Northwestern. Um, 
on a legacy. Uh, this is like an endowment? Or? No, it's a, because my father went there and my, okay. and my grandfather founded it. They, Your grandfather founded yeah. Northwestern yeah. University? Wow, yeah. okay, well, you must take us on this tangent quickly. Yeah. Well, they, they uh, just waived all the uh, requirements and accepted oh, wow. me. <laughs> oh, my gosh, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it was for a PhD, and uh, they expected you to read 14 books a week. Good and I couldn't. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how. I really couldn't. I tried really hard. I got B's the first semester, and by the second semester, I knew this was a disaster. <laughs> I was so far behind and so unable to catch up. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I started working as a carpenter, okay. quit Northwestern. Um, Spent a year as a carpenter's assistant and uh, then got recruited by a friend from National Lewis who said, you should be a teacher. And so originally I was going to be a high school teacher and then met the kind of, there was a, something called the middle school movement. And having already been in many movements before, I thought, oh, this right. is the place for me. So I got to be a part of the middle school movement and uh, started teaching middle school. Wow. And then I think, I believe you told us you taught in Cicero for some yeah. time. Was that your first place you landed? After? Yeah, well, uh, after, um, after being a carpenter and having arthritis and discovering that my elbows didn't like hammering, sure, uh, yeah. I took a job uh, from Northwestern at Chicago Public doing research for them, which was a joke. But it got me into Chicago Public. And I was doing that for a while and then um, saw that a settlement house needed a, a reading teacher. And since that's what I was training to be, I thought, I wonder if I could sell myself to them. Uh, I sold myself, but it was pretty cheap. They paid 13000 a year, so oh, wow. it wasn't much. But it was... Uh, Interesting. I ran a tutoring program. When I started, it had 28 people on the books. And when I finished, we had 360 students that were regularly attending. Wow. So I, they grew quite a yeah, bit. Though. Yeah, it was pretty good. But, um, you know, third year there, I think, uh, we were having a lot of trouble with the gangs. And uh, <laughs> I was sitting at the staff table discussing our gang problem. And they said, Somebody said, we just have to have somebody who goes out and works with them. And everybody turned and looked at me. <laughs> of course, you volunteered as well. <laughs> and so this brings us into late 70s? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 79, you finished at um, Oregon? 79 at Oregon and 80, 83, I think, at, at in National, National Lewis. Lewis. And while I was in National Lewis, I was working in the settlement house running this this program with... Originally, it was just kids, and the next thing I knew, I was gang intervention officer. Interesting. And, uh, on the street in the evenings, stuff like that. Kind of, right. kind of scary stuff. Um, I'm very curious about this. Uh, so you were sort of going door to door. You sort of knew people of the community already and kind of know, knew where to look, I suppose, in a way, to just start a dialogue. Yeah, with, with the gang yeah. kid, you mean? With the gang yeah, kid, Yeah, they found me. You found yeah, you. They were, I'm sure you were hard to find. <laughs> they were um, kind of breaking windows in our building. And, and uh, I went out one night. And I, uh, it's a little scary, but there were a bunch of boys, uh, some of them in their 20s, so they were about my age. Uh, you know, maybe 10 years younger than me, something like that, but big. And uh, mostly Italian and Mexican. And they, and where where exactly in the city was this? West Town. West Town. Uh, so I was on Levitt, uh, okay. between Chicago and Western Avenues. Between Chicago and Grand Avenues, three blocks in from Western Avenues. So okay. Towards the city, so mm -hmm. uh, an old Italian neighborhood, but had been also relocation for Latin Americans and where the settlement house serve both crowds. Mm -hmm. um, they were very anti-black, which was kind of tough because we were very close to Crane High School. So 
So, uh, so lots of conflict happening yeah. in those neighborhoods. Yeah. I had some rowdy, rowdy kids that I worked with, but I went out one night and just said, you know, I'm here to teach your brothers and sisters. Why would you want to torment me? Mm-hmm. And one guy looked at me and he said, because I'm crazy as hell and can do whatever I want. And I said, if you're trying to scare me, I'll piss my pants right now. And he liked that. So uh, I said I was terrified. And I had locked myself out of the building on purpose. And um, it was near when I was going to go home. And so we talked it out. And they, um, they, you know, threw me against the wall and stuff like that. And uh, the next day, my boss got some of his friends and went to visit all these boys. And his friends were... Joey Lombardo, uh, a few of the crazies from Real Gang, uh, and they arrived in Cadillac limousines and stopped at each house and told the boys they weren't to mess with me. Wow. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> so when I had, by this time, remarried, and um, we were... I was working in the summer at the settlement house, and Lombardo was having a block party. And he had a deck made for him up above everybody else. And he and his family sat up there. And uh, he sent a runner to find me and said, I want you to join me at my dinner table. And so I turned to my wife and I said, I think we need to join. And she said, I don't want to go. And I said, I don't think that's a choice. <laughs> yeah, he's not asking. Yeah. So we sat with them. It was pretty stilted. Night, you know, we didn't have anything in common with them. And, and his daughter was gorgeous, but clearly a mob. Yeah, so don't mess with her. Yeah, don't, yeah, don't even look. <laughs> Just glance and keep your eyes yeah. down. So we tried to make small talk for a while, and he was amused, and then let us kind of fade back into the crowd. Thank Kevin. My mm-hmm. wife said she'd never do that again. <laughs> right. I'm sure that was somewhat scary. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. So that sort of brings us to after National Lewis. And then you were hired here in the early 90s? Yeah. After National Lewis, I was hired first in Cicero. In Cicero. Uh, as a reading specialist. And I did uh, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. Uh, interventions with kids who are having trouble reading. Um, in class, you told us a story one time about an incident that I don't know if you witnessed or if you just caught the aftermath of it where you had to stitch someone's arm up. Oh, that was from the settlement house, yeah. That was from then? Yeah. Um, Can you share yeah. that story once more? <laughs> yeah. Um, Franco was uh, a big Italian boy who uh, went to Lane Tech and uh, was their boxing, unlimited weight boxing champion. Um, But he was a street fighter. Mm -hmm. And uh, he got into a fight that the kid basically sliced a 14-inch slice down his forearm. And as a gangbanger, you can't really go to the hospital or you end up with police involvement. Right. So he and his sister arrived the next morning at my desk and he said can you stitch this up and he handed me a needle and thread Uh, I said I've never done this before he said fine just go ahead so I did I pulled the pieces together and sewed up his arm oh my gosh Um, we both had a scotch to do it Um, (laughs) And his sister thanked me. Uh, mess. Uh, and when I was about halfway through, he says, yo, Hilton, no puckers. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought, what are puckers? Oh, I know. Oh, <laughs> he said, look, Franco, I've never done this before. <laughs> if you, you count your blessings, you know. <laughs> right. He wanted to look pretty. Yeah. <laughs> get a better person, maybe get plastic surgery. <laughs> Right. Yeah. So we got it sewed up. I don't know how well I did, but uh, about ten days later, I pulled the stitches out. 
also. Well, I suppose he did plenty well, yeah. yeah. Also with, well with enough. Um, another whiskey uh, for both of us. Right. Um, the stitches had grown in, so there was real plucking going on. But Franco was one of those kids who pretended not to see pain. Right. Um, and he said that I didn't have to worry about the boy who cut him because he was no longer a boy. Whatever that meant. Whatever that yeah. meant. Yeah, of course. Um, so, to say the least, to, uh, your experience in education was not quite like everyone else's. A little, a little tougher. Yes. I, and whether or not you were drawn to it or you felt compelled to do it, it sort of sets you up for the rest of your career as well, though, to influence students like myself. Well, I certainly had a history already. Uh, right. And I wasn't looking for adventure anymore. I had, mm -hmm. had my share of adventure. Absolutely. Um, but I found teaching seventh grade a little bit too intense because... I had every kid's story in my head, uh, right. and there were 130 of them, you know, most classes were somewhere near 130 kids uh, in a grade level mm -hmm. at that school. And so one day there was a newspaper ad for St. Xavier wanting somebody to run their reading clinic, and I knew I was ready to bail from middle school teaching. and. Uh, because you did that for about 10 yeah. years? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, my wife said I became a seventh grader, and that made her really uncomfortable. Uh, yeah. That's um, something I think I'm a little afraid to navigate myself because I feel I'm similar to you in the way where I can't turn off empathy and, and given my history and my upbringing... I can't help but just want to help every, every damn student, you know. And, and there were a lot of damn ones. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. So, so, but after 10 years of doing that, of course, you were fatigued by yeah. it, you know, giving, had given all of, all of yourself for so long. Yeah, um, I had very poor boundaries so that uh, the kids came to my house. Uh, we, I had kids all over the place. I was going to every game and every... Right, you're just collecting yeah. them, yeah. basically. Right. So then when I started here, uh, it was kind of like a, a breath of air because I, I actually had to focus on just doing my job and then going home. Right. And that was pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, college students didn't need me in mm -hmm. the same way. Uh, so I could kind of let loose a little bit and... And right. I could also be a little more myself. Um, so it was really good for me to come here. And I, the read, reading clinic was not um, profitable. And the university was going through one of, the, one of its many financial crises. So uh, a professor named Bill Peters said to me, you need to do something else at the university because they're going to eliminate your job. Hmm. So he took me in uh, his program, which was the field-based program, and he split his salary with me for uh, two summers. Wow. While I got my feet wet in the program. Yeah. yeah. Very generous. Yes, yeah, he was. And uh, I started teaching that, and I think it, I survived there because it was teaching people who are already teachers, um, and it was going to their schools. So originally, we'd get a group of 30 teachers somewhere, and they would meet in somebody's classroom, and I would come in and teach them how to do research and teach them how to do cooperative learning. And um, I was pretty good at kind of running a seminar with adults, Mm -hmm. um, so that went pretty well, and I liked teachers a lot. I was very amazed that um, how actually smart and together teachers are. But I also realized that most teachers were undervalued, 
and I could make them feel valued in the program. And it just did wonders. Uh, yeah, it, I can only imagine. Yeah, it was. So we did really well. Uh, I worked both for St. Xavier and for the company that had come up with the plan. So I was carrying more courses than I was supposed to. But um, <laughs> four nights a week, I was out doing courses mm -hmm. um, everywhere in the state. In fact, one year I was all west of um, Rock Falls, everything west of Rock Falls. So I taught in Rockford and in Moline and in Galesburg and Peoria. Okay. Uh, so I'd just go from one to the other and never go home. Just hopping around yeah. week after week, kind of like you're on tour yeah. over the yeah. Midwest. All these little towns. It was. Yeah. Uh, the last place we taught was Fairbury, which is south of Pontiac. Okay. Uh, north of Springfield, I guess. Yeah, that's um, just even just a little north of Bloomington Normal. Probably. Yes, a little north of Bloomington mm -hmm. Normal. Not mm, exactly okay. a pretty neighborhood, but. No, and I, I can't picture it myself, especially in the 90s, mid, mid or early 90s. I'm sure it was even more rural than it is now. I think so. It was pretty yeah. rural. Um, teachers were, uh, there was still money. We hadn't gone through that crisis where uh, the school economy collapsed. What was that, 2006 or something like that? Yeah, 2008. 2008. Uh, mm. That pretty much killed our program because... Teachers were no longer a stipend to go to the program. Mm -hmm. But when we first started, some schools paid for the whole master's degree. So why wouldn't teachers take it, you know? Absolutely. And I'm sure they would, I'm sure they all wanted to. And then given the resources there, they finally were able yeah. to. And the fact that I came to them rather than, yeah. and I wasn't the only one. I mean, we had a whole bunch of teachers. Some people worked for the, the, private business that was running the program and some worked for St. Savior and uh, we did a mix and, but every night for a Monday through Thursday and then many weekends I did a Saturday, Sunday quick course just to accommodate everyone yeah yeah. and so 24-7 yeah again bad with boundaries yeah, yeah. <laughs> um yeah, and probably led to my divorce uh, uh, that time because uh, mm -hmm. I just stopped being at home. Right. Right. Yeah. And of course, my wife thought I was having an affair. And I wasn't. I wish I was having more fun. I was just working. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, right. Excuse me. So, um, well, I mean, I sort of have this strange philosophy that the work is the reward. Maybe you felt this way as I well. I did, and I could also yeah. make because I was in new towns all the time, I could make it an adventure. Right. You're meeting new people. Yeah. You're, you know, I mean, it's philosophical inquiry. It's fun to do. Yeah. It's somewhat indulgent almost. Yes. But fun. Yeah, and teachers are a kick when they, they're all together. They're not very well behaved, but they're amusing yeah. when they're all together. Certainly. Uh, and uh, <laughs> one group called me the most interesting man, you know, that guy from... Dos Equis ads. Oh, yeah, right, right, that's right. the way I looked. Yeah. And that was kind of an amusing thing. And they, they brought in one of the ads and ran it on the, on the video for me. Oh, yeah. nice. And then so you embodied I that tried, as well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah, that was fun. And so how, and how long did that sort of program run for? That ran until you retired in 2018 or so? No, it ran until 2006. Oh, when the, or, when the crisis. Yeah. yeah. And, February was the last site, and that was probably 2007. Okay. And we were recruiting another group, and the superintendent came and said, if you get your master's, you won't have a job. Interesting. And that pretty much killed the program. They couldn't afford to pay the teachers the higher salary with the right. master's degree? Hmm. Um, do, you th do you find that that's still the case? Do you think that uh, school districts prefer to hire teachers with just the bachelor's degree and then they earn it once they get collect tenure 
or do you find that teachers coming in with the, a master's degree of the program are still favorable when entering the career? That's a good question. A lot of schools economize by hiring a teacher for four years and then letting them go. Right. And they want kids who will do what they're told, uh, teach the skills that they're supposed to teach. Mm -hmm. They kind of, it's not, to me, it's not the profession of teaching. It's more like you're a... Tr Running a business yeah, or something. Yeah. Right. Exploiting yeah. the labor sort of a thing. A lot of schools are still doing that because it works and financially it's reasonable, I guess. Yeah. Um, some schools pride themselves on having masters, teachers, and so they will hire uh, at the master's level. Mm -hmm. But it has to be a kind of upscale school. Right, they have to have lots of resources. Yeah. yeah. Which makes it kind of tough. Like Naperville right now was, will hire a master's pretty willingly. Yeah. Hmm. So that, that splits me personally because I feel I've only just begun my education. Right. And I know that the students in communities like Naperville and other affluent communities probably are not the students who need my help the most. So there's this toss-up that I find myself, and I'm, I imagine lots of teachers beginning their career feel this, where they're not done learning. They still they find themselves enjoying the profession. And to pursue it, I suppose you have to end up in one of those places, but it's not necessarily where the students need the most help or where the most resources should even be allocated. True. Um, I think a couple of things. Kids, no matter what, whether they're wealthy or not, have issues. Of course, and of course. there are lots of them who need help at every level. Um, I suppose the lower income kids probably need more help. Um, but it also takes a certain kind of personality to stay in that setting. Mm -hmm. um, I did both. I taught in Cicero and was planning to stay there because so many kids needed me. It was a great job as a, a reading specialist. But a friend of mine was the consultant for Lincolnwood and uh, said that it was six minutes from my house and uh, that it was a good school and it would support me getting uh, further degrees and more okay. programs. Right. And so I made the switch. Right. Uh, she helped, you know, got me in. Absolutely. Um, 200 of us interviewed for the job. So it was nice that I had a connection. Yeah, that, that it always helps a little bit. <laughs> yeah. But you're certainly deserving as well. Well, thanks, but I, yeah, I, I knew it was the connection that helped. <laughs> right. Um, and they hired me kind of as a boat rocker because they were transitioning from junior high to middle school. And I was in the middle school movement and knew a number of the people who were writing about middle school and um, joined the, there's a middle school association for Illinois and I was a consultant for them. So I had other things going on that made right. me more appealing to Lincolnwood when they hired me. Absolutely, especially in a program, a growing new program like yeah. that. So as a new person, I was the youngest, uh, not the youngest, the newest on, on board. Mm -hmm. By the other person that was hired was six years prior. So they didn't do it. There wasn't a lot of turnover. Um, and they called me boy, which was a little hard to accept as a veteran probably, and being, yeah. you know. I probably had more experiences than any of them. But um, they just, it was weird. Yeah. So I did that for 10 years, nine years, I guess. One year in Cicero and nine years there. Um, and we made the transition from junior high to middle school. The very first faculty meeting, I 
answered questions that the principal was asking. And then the team leaders pulled me aside afterwards and said, only team leaders speak at faculty meetings. And I said, well, that's changing. Right. Because I don't, you're not going to silence me. Um, so there was a lot of, my hackles rose when they, when they told me not to. Yeah. As they should. Yeah. As they should. Not to speak up. We had a new principal and they were trying to freeze her out. Are there any other times, I'm, sure, I'm certain there's dozens of examples you have, but um, that sort of political side to the education where the, uh, in the office politics kind of thing, yes. people try and silence you or hush you in a way. I'm certain there's many examples of that. Well, even, even here. Uh, even yeah. here, yeah. I'm sure it happens everywhere. Um, how do you, how did, oh, well, obviously you just said, but how did you navigate just not telling them to shove it? <laughs> well, I remembered <laughs> telling the lieutenant and uh, how much that cost me. <laughs> okay, so you had to learn to, you got more eloquent at telling them. <laughs> yeah, I think that's yeah. correct. Um, yeah. And I, I think I was feeling more confident about who I was because I wasn't, wasn't faked, you know. I didn't right. have weapons that I didn't know how to use, things like that. Uh, Certainly. Uh, in Vietnam, they issued me a grenade launcher as a secondary weapon um, and gave me something called canister rounds in case I was in a crowd that I needed to eliminate. God bless. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, to argue with teachers at a faculty meeting was a little less stressful. Yeah, uh, I'm sure that was a cakewalk in a sense. I came here um, and as the remediation person for kids who arrived here from community colleges or elsewhere who didn't read well enough to survive learning from books, which right. is basically what academics is about. Absolutely, yeah. And uh, um, I had a kid who uh, tested low on, we, we had a Nelson Denny reading test that we used as a screening tool. Mm -hmm. And if you were in a certain percentile, you got me instead of the university as your instructor. Um, so I taught courses in basically remediation. How do you use a textbook? What's, how do you survive if you're not a good reader? Those kinds of things. So those are the services the university had for non-college level courses? Yeah. I suppose. Yeah. Um, they, I forget what they called them. O ninety nine. O ninety nine. Yeah. I guess you didn't get credit for it uh, towards your degree or something. I took some O ninety nine math. Okay. In, in my <laughs> beginning years. I would have had to too if they if they ever asked me. To. Yeah. Um, anyhow, uh, I think we had O ninety nine in writing and in reading, and I taught both of those. Um, I, I think I'd also taught one on college learning, I think it was called, or college something, I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. And again, it was, I discovered one student had me for all his courses, which I thought, that's probably not very good. Um, and I also was quick to notice that I was white and everybody else was some other color. Right. And that made me, I mean, what am I going to do, say, if you could be white, white like me, you'd survive. It was a little bit yeah. embarrassing and complicated. Absolutely. Um, but one kid <laughs> failed the test the first time, and then as he was taking the test the second time, he says, you know, I carry a gun. And I said, it really? And he said, yeah, and I better not fail. And I was the scorer of the test, and he knew that, too. So I, he wanted to teach preschool. I carried a gun and threatened the professor. And I thought, this is a problem. Mm -hmm. So I went to the faculty meeting and told this story. And I said I didn't think that it evidenced a 
good teacher. And two faculty members told him I had reported him. What the hell were they thinking? <laughs> oh my and God. I, I honestly was fearful getting to my car at night for a while. And I did call the police. Uh, and the, the kid carried a gun because his family ran laundromats in Harvey and places like that. And uh, so he had some purpose in carrying a gun. But uh, I just thought it demonstrated the wrong values to threaten the person that's testing him. Um, but I guess I other faculty agree. didn't agree. So you were that's talking about politics. That was a different thing. I lost it the next faculty meeting. I, I went ballistic on Rightfully so. I mean... Put me at risk. It was totally crazy. Why would you do that? Yeah, I, I, giving the benefit of the doubt, I would assume it's just ignorance they did it out of, but it, hopefully it's not maliciously, but I... Yeah, I, don't I didn't know, know either. Yeah. Yeah, so that was a, a big disappointment that my peers would set me up like that. Uh, it also probably pushed me away for a while from being here. I was glad that I got to be off campus uh, a lot. Right. Because I, I didn't trust my peers. <laughs> just didn't interface well with them after and, that, absolutely. Yeah. But that changed, okay. obviously, after I became a regular faculty on campus. Didn't take long before I was faculty president, so I must have done something right along the way. They liked you. They they learned to like you, maybe <laughs> yeah, something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Wow. So. So there's politics in schools, um, certainly, and it's difficult when you first start because you think you've got some hot ideas on how this might work and what you might do. Right. And it's hard to recognize that some of the techniques that teachers use work for them. They may not be healthy for the students, but they work for them. And I don't know how much you want to get involved in criticizing a peer. Probably little. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and I think there's something to be said for keeping your cards close to your chest when you're first starting. Absolutely. Sort of prove yourself a, a little. little. Yeah. Get yeah. some grounding. Get uh, And every school is different. Mm -hmm. And it's helpful if the attitude isn't uh, prove yourself before we befriend you, which is often the case. Right. So the first couple of years you're on your own. Mm -hmm. And you're lucky if any of the senior faculty will give you the time of day. Other schools really support their new teachers and they assign a mentor or, you know, have ways of including you and stuff. Mm -hmm. So it, it really depends on the school. Uh, and in Lincolnwood, I knew I had been brought in to stir things up, so I did a pretty good job at that. Yeah. Um, they, but they were already anticipating that given the yeah. reformatting of everything yeah. as well. Yeah. yeah. So there was some, it was transition happening. Uh, some of the people who gave me grief ended up no longer being team leaders, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um. hmm. So um, that's something I feared as well, you know, entering the field. I don't want to appear or sound naive because I've, I feel I have very ambitious goals. Um, so it's good to hear you say that maybe you tread lightly in the beginning. I think so. Um, yeah. There, some schools are ruled by women who don't want men to succeed. That scares me. It is a problem. Um, it scares me because... Because, I mean, myself in particular, you know, speaking from my perspective... I don't know if there was another job that I would want. I've had lots of really shitty jobs, and uh, <laughs> and um, I don't like them very much. So the whole reason that I'm continuing through all of this and and have made it a point this late in my life, because I'm older than most doing this, 
um, is because there's nothing else I'd rather do. And like I said earlier, the work is the reward. Absolutely. And, and the reward for hard work is better work. Like, that's sort of my mentality and my philosophy. So should I find myself faced with that, I don't know exactly what I'll do. I'll probably be very upset <laughs> because I only... And, and it, it bothers me to think that administrators especially would not have the best intentions of the people they're hiring and in the future of their students as well, you know. But I suppose the bias exists in people and I shouldn't be, I mean, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm not even there yet, but, but that does scare me a bit to think that it could be an oversight. Two of the fellows I went through my PhD program with had been teachers in schools where they honestly felt they were crowded out by the women who, who there were, you know, comments about maybe they were touching the children or, you know, making it kind of scary. That's, that is, yeah, that terrifies me to think to be accused of something like that so malicious and so that would destroy students. That would not be what you're studying for or why you're even entered this profession. Exactly. That scares the hell out of me <laughs> to think that. Um, well, uh, I think rather than... Uh, it's really important to find a school that you fit with. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't always happen. You have to be willing to change jobs if you need to. Sure. Um, and... I found that it was easier to teach kids who have a similar background than it was for me to teach the working class kids, even though I'd had quite a bit of experience with gangs and stuff like that. Uh, and had worked in the working class neighborhood for seven years, I think I did, mm -hmm. in the settlement house. Um, I still discovered that in Lincolnwood, my verbosity, my style, fit better. Certainly. So I was pleased that I'd made the change, uh, even though seventh graders and just in their very nature can drink everything you've got, you know. Right. Uh, so what I liked about Lincolnwood was that they valued me. They valued uh, me taking courses elsewhere. Uh, I ended up having a double master's plus 46 hours, so um, too many hours in school, but yeah. um, but I loved learning about various things, so it was, for me, very useful. I took the ESL training three times, three different programs, mm -hmm. because the university, I mean, the, the school paid for it, so. Um, you might as yeah. well. Right, continue to study. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah, that's what excites me as well, going through this. Um, so you have to ask when you're interviewing, do you have, how do, how do, you, um, how do you handle further development? Um, is there potential to, you know, work in the field up beyond? Can I, I joined the Reading Association for Illinois and uh, forced the school to allow me to go every year to the big conference. Uh, then friends from National Lewis got me to present. So, you know, it was kind of a different way to use my teaching and kept me engaged with what's new and exciting about teaching. Absolutely. So I believe the schools, the best schools, cultivate further learning. As they should, yeah. right? Um, I suppose most schools would if they had the resources, yeah. or I like to believe they would. Yeah. I would think so. Um, so, specifically regarding my case, because that's where I can only speak from, um, coming up here on the end of my undergrad and student teaching, now I find myself torn because um, I've been making art as you know, a means of output as well as a way for sharing and growing community. So I find myself torn, and maybe you have some insight into this. Um, when pursuing the next postgraduate degree, what benefit, if any, do you think an MFA program would have where I would be 
mostly creating work. Uh, Eisner calls it creating knowledge. Yeah. And um, so I'm, I, ha- I hesitate to tell you this, but I suppose it's the, uh, the best time, really, because I haven't really said it out loud to anyone just yet. But in this context, it makes sense. Um, and it's certainly going to sound naive. I already know that. But along with education, I know now, some time ago in my life, I realized that I didn't know my life's purpose. And so I had to make it my life's purpose to discover it. And so now I know what I want to do. I know why I want to do it. I don't necessarily know how it's going to get done just yet. So I'm wondering if using art as a way to engage a community is a quicker route or a more clean route, given all of the political things, as opposed to getting a position at a school as an art teacher and kind of working outward. I have this grand idea to give away for free homes and property to families that need them. Mm -hmm. And I think I can manage it through sort of starting with an arts center and community in a neighborhood and then inviting them in and getting a dialogue with the neighborhood about anything and everything, what concerns them, and using art as a means to facilitate those conversations because I find and I think most people who are drawn to a creative passion that art is the quickest way to empathize with someone because as a maker and as a viewer or a consumer of art the goal is always to feel what what the artist is trying to communicate and vice versa when I make work it's to communicate something So, um, and I don't know what that looks like exactly in a high school setting. You know, I think that creating sort of a community of other art teachers who are already in these communities and working with them would be a quick route to sort of drive students and families to this effort. Um, but like I said, this is the how is the... Yeah, it's uh, complicated. Is the uncertain part. Having worked at Settlement House um, Mm -hmm. and having worked with two or three people who brought art into the schools and then quickly decided that school wasn't the place that they were looking for, Mm -hmm. um, I can see that it's uh, always going to be a challenge. Some of the parks and some of the ways you can get in and get supported through parks or settlement houses or those kinds of things. Um, But there's never a big profit margin in this. Yeah, so I already know I'm going to be broke for the rest of my life. (laughs) That's kind of the life I've lived. Um, Yeah. Which is fine, because if I had means anyway, I would just... Give it away. Give it yeah, away. So I don't know what I would do. Pretty anyway much that way too. Um, yeah. When I have money, I give it to people, so that doesn't make sense. Uh, no, absolutely not. Like, um, like I said, it sounds. It probably sounds very naive, but I want to buy a a home um, in this neighborhood and turn it, or in one of these neighborhoods, and turn it into a community space. Like, you know, throw all of my resources at it for no good reason other than. I feel compelled to do so. See, philosophy, there's Arthur, um, his last name. He has a community going with arts involved. Um, the Astrogates? Hmm? The Astrogates? No. As a philosopher? Yeah, philosophy professor. Arthur, he's a big, heavy guy. Here yeah. at St. Xavier? I don't know if I'm familiar. You should check them out. He, he I will, keeps the yeah, community alive, and they they do art. And I actually talked to Bathgate about it. I certainly yeah, know. Because he's friends with Arthur, and he's part of that community. They do uh, uh, Dungeon and Dragons as a, okay. as a draw. Okay. I'm not, uh, yeah, I'm not a board game yeah. man, but whatever yeah. works. Well, it's, yeah, yeah. But some of the people in his, he's kind of built a group of, people from the community that work with him and uh, they, they have something going like an art center. So um, 
I'd encourage you to at least. Arthur, what is his last name? Oh, I'll find it. I'll get his email. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Absolutely. Um, and he's, he's worth talking to, too, just himself. But Bathgate could introduce you and it would work yeah. for you. Absolutely. Yes. No, I'll certainly reach out. Another goal, like I mentioned in these conversations, is that, especially over the last two years, sitting and talking with someone, that rarely happens, yes. you know, especially in a, a long format situation like right. this. So I find it very valuable to sort of collect these conversations oh. and use them as a resource. Yeah, I could see that. And it, your own input is important because it gives you reflection time. You, you go back and hear yourself and hear what other people right. had to say. And it, it's good reflection. Absolutely. Very much how comedians record their sets. Yeah. That's kind of how I am uh, approaching this as well. That's fun. My, my son is a pharmacist and he hates it. But he's also uh, working on being a stand-up comic. Really? What's his name? Uh, <laughs> yeah, come on. <laughs> Michael Iason. He's a, Michael Iason, yeah. okay. He's not out there yet, but uh, he, because he's raising kids, it's kind of mm. hard to do everything at once. Uh, of but he's really good at what he's doing, So, but it's, he doesn't like it and he wants to do something else. So I think he's going to... Be a pharmacist until he can pivot yeah. into yeah. comedy. That's um, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a whole art form in itself. Yes. And, and there's uh, a lot of it on YouTube. You can amuse yourself with. I do all the time. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, for fun, I just spent too much money on some old Richard Pryor records. Oh, yes. So I'm excited to listen to yeah, those. Yeah, that's kind of amazing. Yeah. yeah. Whenever, I, whenever I get one one foot in something I end up just going all in so <laughs> okay. you know, with music or art or a comedy or whatever the case yeah. is or reading you know that's something that so you probably don't know that you did this but when you when you suggested to me after our course History of Ed that I should read Eisner and Dewey I certainly did and I find myself now those two the two of them really shaped my philosophy Wonderful. and the way that I communicate my ideas is very much in their sort of cadence now. Very nice. And um, Eisner especially. Yeah, Eisner is particularly good if you're art-based, uh, I mm -hmm. think. Uh, there are others, but he's uh, an, a long-time voice. Uh, Absolutely. thoughtful. So the book you recommended to me was, um, by Dewey, was um, Art as Experience. Yes. I'm wondering if you were drawing parallels from his writings and teachings when you were do when you worked on what was the name of your uh, I forget now here subject matter as experience a guide to curriculum uh -huh. this is something you contributed uh -huh. to right yes. was this was his work influential yes. very yeah. much uh, I I think I didn't I read Dewey's Democracy and Education um, fairly early. Mm -hmm. uh, and probably didn't get as much from it as I should have, because his writing style is a little different from others. Yeah, I got to slow down sometimes yeah. with him. Mm -hmm. um, so when I got to grad school uh, at UIC, uh, I revisited him, and that's when I found that uh, art artist experience. I think it is, uh, mm -hmm. which was better for me than the the. Uh, democracy one because I couldn't figure out how to do democracy in a classroom. Hmm. Uh, classrooms are set up authoritarian. Are you familiar with uh, Professor Harry Wong? No. This is someone that um, maybe you know um, the Methodist teacher now, Paul at the, just now at the university. Anyway, so and also uh, maybe you know GD, she's the art teacher at Mother Macaulay and has been for yes. some time. She introduced me to him originally, and he's famous for coming up with this s sort of introducing democracy in the classroom, the way he, you know, there has to be boundaries, there has to be rules, there has to be consequences, but I'm gonna, we're going to take the first day or so here and we'll figure out them together. So what happens when you don't something turn, turn something in? Yeah. Do I just... Do I just let it go? I let it slide? you have till whenever to give me everything? Or what's the consequence? There must be one. So the students pick the consequence. The students pick, you know, 
what you should happen in that sense. Mm -hmm. And and I found his Professor Wong's teachings in that sense to be very helpful when just trying to abstractly think about how a classroom should or could run well. Mm -hmm. um, one of the hassles my daughters had with art at the high school level was that about half the class was in there because they thought it would be an easy grade. She teaches art as well? Uh, no. They were students in the art classes. But they, um, they wanted to do art, and they were horrified that kids were disruptive and stopped the progress of things. You know, They went to Evanston Township. Okay. And uh, the art classes were often seen as a way out of academics. And, uh, it bothers me that art gets that sort of... Yeah. Um, that sort of negative connotation. It bothered to it. them a lot because they, they, you know, we had quite an emphasis on valuing art, and things would be destroyed and people would be crazy, and and so both kids dropped art and moved on to uh, more academic classes because it was just easier, less painful. Less of a hassle. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that art teacher and probably the school, for that matter, didn't have a good handle on what it meant to teach art. I think you're right. I think you're right. Um, yeah. Because <laughs> the, the ones that they had at middle school ended up living in uh, Chicago and organizing art program there and dropping teaching. Interesting. I um, wonder if I could get, I could probably get her name and address for you. Um, that I'll would have be a look. See. Yeah. So, Absolutely. So either of my kids stayed in touch. I don't know if they did. Any resources you could turn me on to, yeah. I would absolutely love. Okay. You know, I just love picking people's brain at the very least. You yeah. Know. So. Well, I, um, I loved my PhD program. That was probably the most. And the university pushed me, this one. I had my mm -hmm. double master's so they could hire me. Mm -hmm. um, but to get my PhD, uh, was tough when I was taking every night to teach. Right. Uh, it's hard to find courses and stuff like that. So when they finally said, you know, if you don't have your PhD, you're going to lose your job, I said, I can't teach one night a week. I have to take courses that night. So for a long time, Tuesday night was my night at the university. Uh, and then summers, I had to stop teaching summer school for St. Xavier and do summers at UIC. That's when you would collect all your, do all your coursework. Yeah, a then. lot of it. Mm -hmm. um, I had a lot of help at UIC with setting it up so that I could get my courses done. And uh, My thesis advisor was pretty good about democracy and education and how do you, how do you shape your own program and what is it you want and Mm -hmm. I, he, he was funny. I was in the reading program because that was my area of expertise uh, and not doing well because it seemed forced and it wasn't much fun. And right. uh, <laughs> Schubert found me in the hall and said, you know, your favorite reading teacher has moved to one of the Seven Sisters colleges in the, in the East. Um, and I teach curriculum. Have you ever thought about that? And I said, well, not really. He said, step into my office mm -hmm. and talk me into his program. And I said, well, actually, I got into the reading program because I'd worked with Tim Shanahan in my school district. And Tim said he had a dream about me being in the Ph.D. program. So Schubert picks up the phone, calls Tim Shanahan and says, I had a dream about Hilton being in a curriculum program. Wow. <laughs> And poked at him and finally said, I, I'd switch majors. <laughs> wow. That's so funny. Yeah. Yeah. So. Oh, my gosh. So, and then throughout your PhD, when thinking about curriculum, what was unique to your perspective do you think you brought? Um, I think it was probably trying to make curriculum democratic. Uh, okay. Uh, trying to help teachers you know, it's, it's funny, you, you teach a class of 30 women who are used to being in charge. Really difficult. Um, and teachers would say, oh, I know that. And I'd say, share. 
Right. Let's hear what you know. And that kind of... Uh, we actually got a lot of interesting input. But I could keep it orchestrated. I could keep them moving and keep what they said in the direction that I needed it to go. Right. Uh, so it was really more like... Um, conductor. Right, you're just, it's more seminar based and you're kind of collecting yeah. anecdotes here and here. It was tough when there were 45. That's a lot of voices. Yeah. But when it was 20, 25, uh, it, was, yeah. it was really good. It was really fun. Uh, what are some things you would do to poke at them a little bit? What are some things you would do to kind of draw out their ideas? Well, uh, one of them was I, I made them listen to their students. Uh, they had to come back and report on various conversations with students. And teachers get, a lot of teachers think, I keep my class organized, I have my lessons, and anybody can come through here and they'll be better off for it. Mm -hmm. My goal was to have them say each individual is worth knowing and paying attention to. I can't say I made a lot of converts, but I did make some. Um, a lot of teachers thought teaching phonics was the only way to teach reading. And so I showed them that you could teach by interest, you could teach by, you know, there's ways of hooking kids. And once you've hooked them, then you can step back and let them take over. Right. And so my emphasis was always on who are your students how do they behave? How do you interact with them? When do they have opportunity to be voices? And how do you have a class like mine where you hear all the voices and and it would challenge? And some some of yeah. the teachers didn't like it, but a lot most of them liked it. Yeah, I suppose it can be difficult to be compelled to think more more thoughtfully. That's not I say the right phrasing, but more so that the knowledge isn't a side effect of what you're doing, more to connect with the student and get them to engage, to have a, a dialogue back and forth, a relationship around building knowledge. And I think if you can stay focused on, I have some knowledge that I want them to develop or mm -hmm. a direction I'd like them to begin to go. Um, the ones who want to tell you about a movie they saw you have to kind of draw them back in. How, what, are, what are the connections you're making? How, did, how does this piece fit with that piece? Um, we're looking at something, you know, we're looking at the way you organize class. How did that fit in? Right. So we had a, a course called Team Seminar where we basically troubleshot. You know, I want you to do cooperative learning. Where are you having issues? What worked, what didn't work, tell me about it. Right. And that was the best class for me because that's when teachers could say, you know, well, I tried this much and it, it didn't go. Or, and then another teacher will say, I did that, and then I did this. And so you could take what they were creating and share it and make it. Right. So we all owned it. Yeah, and... I think that that just just embodying that sort of philosophy is probably plenty enough for a teacher to be more proficient at communicating. I think so. Yeah, that sort of Socratic questioning. Yeah. Just very similar to what a, a baseball coach might do or something. It know? was similar. And in fact, yeah. I had coaches in there who were actually pretty good at figuring out how to do what I did. Right. So that was kind of fun. Yeah, just the simple question of what's working. Yeah. Tell me what's working. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I had on my evaluations, teachers would say, I learned a lot in that class, but he didn't teach me anything. For yeah. you? Huh. And I would say to, when I'd called in by the dean, you know, to address this issue, right. I would say, it's not an issue. How wonderful. Yeah, how wonderful. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> I wasn't in charge. They yeah. learned on their own. I'm great. Right. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I caught on to that very quickly in our class because we had a small class. We had, there's me, five of us. 
So if no one was talking about what we were reading, then it was quiet. Yes, it was very quiet. <laughs> so I was like, all right, well, I'm going to read this because <laughs> I don't want to sit for 90 minutes or an hour in silence about yeah. this. So I, I, that class I could run as a seminar. Uh, and I think I treated you like graduate students anyhow. Very much. Yeah. Just, yeah. So bring your ideas, share your ideas. Yeah, I mean, I I wouldn't accuse you of not teaching me, but um, <laughs> I certainly learned a great deal in the course, just from the text, but also the conversations about the text and the way that you would poke at us to, to facilitate our own ideas huh. about what we're reading. Yeah. And some people didn't read. That made it a lot harder. Yeah. They would create things, but not necessarily, not necessarily move forward in their thinking, mm -hmm. and that always felt uneasy for me. Absolutely. Um, reading the text helped a lot, but not everybody learns from text. No, I, and I don't think that I learn best from text either. Um, if I read, if I read something, I read it two or three times, and lots of reflection happening and drawing many parallels to other things less abstract, yep. you know, than someone's thinking. My problem is I do that while I'm reading, which... Um, oh, yeah. yeah. Um, Very much. Schubert, my thesis advisor, said, I, you're not a slow reader. You're one of those uh, intense readers. Yeah. No. I, I very much. As I pick through Eisner, you know, I still open this up very often. And I'll come to a line or I'll come to a phrase... And then I'll spend 30 minutes not looking at the book because I'm like, oh, my God, what the hell? This is amazing, <laughs> you know? And I have to sit with that. Yeah. And, um, but that's what's most enjoyable, really. I think so, too. I like yeah. to read, but I'm not a I'm not, uh, speed reader. I couldn't do 14 books a week like they asked me to do at Northwestern. Yeah. I Certainly didn't not. understand why we would do 14 books a week. It just seemed a waste of books. I mean, Yeah, ridiculously arbitrary as well. Yeah to comb through so much, such a broad amount of knowledge and not necessarily distill it into anything useful, right. perhaps. Seminars were tough. Um, most of the students in there uh, at Northwestern had, well, first of all, it was competing because they were only going to fund half of us for the second year. Okay, so very competitive. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so students cut articles out of our resources so other students didn't have them, which just made me crazy. I did not understand why that was happening. They'd go to the library and cut out the articles that we were supposed to read. Because it was so competitive yeah. for the stipend. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. And then they'd share with one or two other people. So we'd come in, and we weren't able to get the book. What do you say then? Well, God bless the Internet. Cause <laughs> yeah, it's a change now. Yeah. yeah. That's cutthroat. Um, yeah. I would not have imagined that, really. It was pretty awful. Yeah. Uh, and I started carrying a bota with me and just having a little bit of wine while I was doing this because they were just too much for me. Uh, oh, my gosh. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So I sat in the library and sucked wine from the air, you know. <laughs> right. That's useful in its own yeah. way, that sort of meditation. Um, and also I read my grandfather's writings which are enshrined there so I had my own right what is your grandfather's name uh, Judge Andrew Brown Judge Andrew Brown and was Northwestern founded as a law school no um, <sighs> Judge Brown and a couple of other people owned uh, large tracts of land that it was a farm and okay. they when the city burned Everybody wanted to move to the burbs, so they plotted their farms and uh, created Evanston and then decided as Presbyterians they needed a university. So they got together and planned a university that would have pretty much everything. Okay. And my namesake, my, uh, the Hilton member of my family, graduated from Garrett, which is the seminary that's also part of Northwestern. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, Methodist Episcopal Seminary. Um, so he studied theology then? Or it was just something... That's what they did. I did that's what they I did. Didn't do that. 
Yeah. I uh, was doing American history. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. That's, I can't believe that. I mean, it's so funny, too. Such a uh, big name in academia, Northwestern, just yeah, kind of rose up that way. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I, well, my f- grandfather uh, used to own Dempster Street to Main Street in Evanston, uh, Ridge to the Lake. Wow. So a lot of Evanston was his property. And he was just a farmer? Originally. Originally. Wow. He wasn't just a farmer because he was also involved with law, but um, right. But he owned the farm mm-hmm. okay. and then divided it up and, and made it into a village and then a town. Yeah. That's amazing. It is amazing. Well, that, that could be a whole podcast in itself, probably. <laughs> yeah. The history of all yeah. that. But, but it's so unique. Yeah, it was. Uh, and because I was the third family my father had raised, uh, and he died when I was so young, I didn't have any of that story. I learned it by going to Northwestern. Oh, wow. I didn't know I had a legacy. I didn't wow. know how I got accepted there until I met the president of the university and he explained to me that I was on legacy and what a legacy was. I didn't know what a legacy was. Wow. So you didn't know when you applied? No. Oh my gosh. I knew that my father had been, in, my father had graduated from Northwestern. I knew that much. Mm-hmm. That's unbelievable, really. So, so when you're sitting in the library, then you're kind of doing, you know, you're, um, you're piecing together your family. Yeah. You're very much kind of backtracking on that. And pro- and yes. probably very interesting to discover all of it that. It was. And kind of... I found myself you know, at the Newberry Library doing a lot of uh, reading of family documents and stuff like that. And uh, Evanston's Historical Society in the, the one of the houses on, on the lake is another source where I discovered things my great-grandfather... And, um, my grandmother, the, his daughter, was the first woman graduate of Northwestern. Yeah. Really? And so that was kind of interesting, too, to learn all this stuff. But it was very distracting. I wasn't reading my texts. I was doing oh, yeah. doing this other stuff. So I thought somehow I was going to be a historian of you know local history and that kind of thing. Discovered that there was a fellow who had been at Northwestern for 14 years who was... Uh, still doing local history and never finished his degree and never did his dissertation and no. but kept going to school there. Um, and I thought, I don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. And since I wasn't very good at getting the assignments done, uh, they didn't really want me back. So they, they weren't going to fund me. So I yeah. withdrew. Fair enough. Yeah. It worked out yeah. for you either way. Yeah, well, I, I ended up um, working for tutoring kids um, and found a place called the uh, One-to-One Learning Center. And I worked for them as a tutor doing middle school kids. Mm-hmm. Um, and they, the leader, the owner of that program, also taught at National Lewis. And so she said what the hell, you're wasting your time. You should be a teacher. Yeah. So she was the first one to kind of pull you in that yeah. direction then? Yeah. Interesting. Uh, yeah. She also took me out drinking. And, you know, it was quite entertaining. Right. Her husband and I did construction together. It was kind of interesting mix. Yeah. It always intrigues me to hear those stories because I feel like myself and students these days, academia is very, very, you know, buttoned up. Yes. If you don't get those sort of interesting relationships with your professors and peers where you're hanging out and sort of letting your guard down and goofing around a bit as well, as, along with all of the learning and knowledge building happening. So I'm jealous of you <laughs> in that way. It may have been different times. I don't know. Uh, I was pretty lucky all the way. I've been lucky all the way along. Yeah. You know, I, um, I, when I was in England, I had a friend who was acting Um, So, went to visit him. Uh, He was in a play called The Unknown Soldier and His Wife, 
written by Peter Ustinov, who I liked. I thought he was mm -hmm. an interesting person, so I'd read some of his stuff and seen him in a couple of things. He was, he played Perot for, uh, yeah, I get the Christie stuff on television. And oh, yeah. really? So uh, he was kind of an interesting guy. Um, my friend had me in the lobby after the play and handed me a coat and said, wait right here. And so I'm standing there with this coat and Peter Ustinov walks up to me and says, I believe you have my coat. <laughs> and very I, cool. I kind of lost it. I was not able to respond in a very sensible way. But he said, if you give me my coat, I'll take you out for drinks. Fair enough. <laughs> and then my friend joined us and we went for drinks. And, and then Peter Ustinov said, you know, have you been to the Royal Academy yet? Uh, do you know, I forget who the actor was. Uh, big name and I said I didn't he said well here's a connection I'll get you there so he, he wrote a little note I carried it with me and there I was in the Royal Academy watching a play uh, I think it was uh, uh, Cherry Orchard okay I'm not familiar, it's a Swedish but... play it's a little bit grim but uh, dissolving of a marriage kind of thing Ooh, but okay. it was it was really good and Ustinov's uh, The Unknown Soldier and His Wife uh, was brilliant. It was funny and fun, and it was, mm -hmm. and he did a brilliant job acting in it. So it was great fun, and the, it was just coincidental. You know, I was just visiting a friend, right? And he thought it'd be funny to hand you his yeah. coat. Yeah. Those are the best stories, though. Yeah. Really. It, but you were talking about connections. I've been lucky like that. I've, I, yeah. I, I stay open to possibilities. Well, do they say, don't they say luck is? you know, preparation and opportunity. Probably, so yeah. you put yourself there in some sense and then yeah. the rest kind of fell yeah. in. That's what I attribute luck to mostly, right? So I suppose. I, th I think as long as you're doing things that you're interested in, honestly, right? Uh, then there's a lot of room for connections and uh, meeting people and stuff like that. I like to think that people see that in individuals, so. you know. They, they can pick apart some authenticity and they know that, okay, they're worth having a conversation with or they're worth sharing yeah. with, yeah. you know. Uh, so I, th I think that in that regard, I've been very lucky and yeah. open to it. Right. So, on the other hand, some people would think that my Vietnam experience was not very lucky. Well, that's what gives you a unique perspective because... Statistically, you're in the anomaly in this yes. case, very much. Yeah, just being alive so, after that experience was <laughs> right a gift. Of course, yeah. and then to have such a have had such a fruitful career working with ten thousand people, you probably come in contact or more. Possibly, you know, yeah. yeah, yeah, over your many many yeah. years. And I must say that once the Facebook happened. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, all those former seventh graders, are, are they all? Find yeah, you? they find me, and uh, that's that's kind of fun, you know. Oh, I bet. A couple of them, uh, you know, you were my favorite, and so I've gone out for drinks or lunch or various things like that. With I was their favorite, you know, and they wanted to know yeah. what I was as an adult, and that was kind of fun. Right, kind of reveal yourself to them a little bit, and they reveal a little bit of who they've become. Yeah. That's super interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. And a couple of them uh, had kids with reading problems and would call me and say, what do I do? How, do, how can you, right. can you come and meet my son and convince him that he should be a reader? <laughs> I tried that. It didn't work so well. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, that, you know, it's nice that students remembered what I taught and how I taught it. And one, t one student who had been total pain, a stuff shirt, father taught math at Northwestern, uh, and she felt I was just outrageous, uh, too loose, too unstructured. Um, she came back after being at college uh, and called me and said, I finally learned what you were trying to do. <laughs> Why don't you teach at college? <laughs> I said, I do now. <laughs> she said, that makes more sense. 
Mm, very so good. Whatever it was that I was doing in, in seventh grade, she didn't want to buy it, but when, yeah. when she got to college, she liked it. So. And remembered. Isn't that weird? It's not so weird, really. I, I thought it was wonderful. Yeah, it's wonderful, yeah. but yes, yeah, so I don't think it's weird. Um, just even in my short life, I've realized that while you feel insignificant day in, day out somewhat, Absolutely. you know, you kind of, yeah. you're kind of just going about it. You get an email or you get a phone call or a text message and you're like, oh, what do you mean you've been paying attention or thinking about something <laughs> yeah. we did? And, and you realize everyone is that way, or most people are that way anyway, where they're, when they get some sort of influence or help, they're grateful and they just want to say thank Hopefully. you. Hopefully. And it's yeah. much easier now that there's the internet. Yeah. Because, um, you know, I have friends who taught earlier and they don't, they didn't have contact with their students after they left. Right. They didn't get that satisfaction. Right. Yeah. The internet is a great tool, and I exploit the hell out Good. of it. I, I send emails to people I have no business talking to. Good. Excellent. You know, just to bend their ear for a little bit and ask them to do something like this. Yeah. Or, I think that's terrific. I yeah. was thrilled when you called me or contacted me. I think you did it on Facebook. I hit. I messaged you through Facebook first because I wasn't certain if your email you, would yeah. still catch you. So I was happy to get your response. Yeah. I mean, this is a this is sort of an indulgent thing to speak this way with people. You only get these sort of conversations maybe a couple times a year with close friends. You know, where you're actually you're, talk through stuff like your own life, yeah. right? And just sort of how does my life match with somebody else's life and that kind of thing? Yeah, absolutely. And the the podcast format is so unique because. Well, I'm, I think you told me you don't, you don't indulge in podcasts very much. Not very much. Not very much. So the coolest thing about it to me is that all of, all of your heroes, or all of my heroes, they're all on the Internet, right? They all have their voice on the Internet. And only in, in this window of time, you know, in, in previously throughout history, there's a celebrity, there's someone who's a prolific at whatever they do, it was sort of just in the canon that they were great. They were born great. And so what's cool about the podcast is you get to hear about the 10 years where they ate shit <laughs> and yeah. sucked at what they yep. did. And that's so insightful to hear artists and educators and community leaders talk about the struggles, talk about their, themselves as individuals and what they were thinking and why they were thinking it and chance encounters and this and that. Because before it was just assumed that these people were born great, <laughs> and yeah. I have no chance at being great. Yeah. So that's why I I sincerely enjoy the, the, listening the to more depth of, of other people. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Um, I was thinking at Northwestern. I mean, no, it was at, at UIC. We happened to go. My wife and I happened to go to a conference of philosophers, and there was a guy named. Barack Obama speaking. Um, and it was very early in his career. He's a community organizer, and this was a community project. It was public intellectuals. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was considered a public intellectual at the time. And it was just so cool to hear what he had to say very early on in his career. And, oh, and I bet. recognize that he became president, you know. It's right. just nice. Yeah. yeah, you get to hang out with him for an afternoon. And yeah, just learn somewhere. some stuff. Yeah, yeah. Very brilliant man. Absolutely, yeah. he was a. You know, all presidents have their duty to the country, but him more than most, especially in the last couple we've had. Yeah. You know, it felt like, yeah. it truly felt like there was some promise and hope during his presidency. Yeah, it did. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, very much. Yeah, so it's uh, fun to. Uh, use education as a way to get to things and to try things. Um, and I, I love art as a, my first wife was a dancer for Joffrey Ballet in New York City. Oh, really? And uh, got injured, so she had to quit. Um, they, they tried having her dance on feet filled with Novocaine and it just wasn't the same, you know, but it was the only way she could tolerate it. Yeah. Um, so she became, uh, she did art, uh, she was the 
writer for the San Francisco Chronicle for the arts, the performing arts. What year was this? Yeah, 2000, a little earlier. Okay. Yeah. Um, she, she's, a, she's the one whose father had screwed with me. Mm-hmm. Um, but we, we were always on the edge of art with her, and she did photography and uh, through the Park District in San Francisco. And through that, met somebody who was connected with the Chronicle. And, you know, they knew that she was a dancer. She now runs a community program called... Uh, Motion Arts. Motion yeah. Arts. Uh, she's the director of the program. And it's basically helping folks who want to use dance and theater. Uh, and how do you do it and what do you do and you know, all that right. stuff. And so it's a, it's a think tank sort of thing for the arts. That's in San Francisco? Yeah. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. So she's, she stayed in she it? She did. And she's, made a living and survived. She's yeah. in a couple of music videos as a oh, really? dancer. Interesting. Yeah. Anyone we no. would know? <laughs> no? Uh, some punk groups. Maybe. Okay, well, I yeah, might you know might, them, but though. I didn't, so I can't oh, okay. report on them. Uh, Fair enough. I didn't stay in touch with her. She called me after her father died, and that's right. when we first got in touch again. Yeah. Um, oh, there was a funeral we went to. A friend of mine committed suicide, and... Mm. Uh, he had been at my house about a week before he decided to commit suicide. So that's terrible. Yeah, it was awful. And he was in San- Saratoga, uh, you know, a think mm-hmm. tank at Stanford. Um, second time at the think tank. And I, he, anyhow, so I, I saw her at that funeral too because she was right. a mutual friend, you know. Certainly. He and I discussed how best to cut your throat. And you were probably kidding. Yeah. I, I was know. just kind of talking about what you had to do when you were killing somebody. Mm-hmm. And how the easiest place was that soft part of the neck. And uh, Little did you little know. Little did I know. Yeah. Um, Kitchen knife. I was used to a Bowie knife. I had someone very close to me commit suicide as well. Someone who gave me a big leg up in life, and uh, it changed the way I viewed the world pretty drastically. Um, I don't know if we, I don't know if in class I told you Oops. before. Sorry, you're fine. You're fine. Um, that I'm a high school dropout. I dropped out of high yeah, school. Yes, she did tell me a little bit. I I come from a broken home, yeah. and uh, you know, parents had their own troubles. But um, my best friend's father, Jim gave me a big leg up in life. Um, I just told this story for the first time the other day, actually, and uh, I'd love to tell you. So <clears throat> I was homeless briefly, and my friend Jake moved me into his basement. Yes. We didn't tell yeah. anybody, as a friend does, yeah. right? And I'm living there for a while, and I'm sneaking out, coming and going, coming and going. And The then, dad pretended not to know? Well... Well, maybe for a day or two he pretended. But I think I got away with it for a little okay. bit there. And um, one afternoon, I should be in class. Uh, the basement door flies open, you know, with a, in a big dramatic fashion. And uh, Jim yells down the stairs. He says, Chuck, come upstairs. I got to talk to you. And I go, oops. <laughs> okay, I'll be right there. So I drag my feet and I think, like, uh, what the hell am I going to do now? Am I going to yeah, run back away? Back the street, yeah. Right. So I come up the stairs. Um, he was a machine operator. He worked hard. You'd get home early in the afternoon and uh, you'd have a beer, you yeah. know. He'd watch uh, History Channel or something was usually mm-hmm. always on. He was smoking cigarettes, too. So I come up the stairs behind him. Table's over here. Come up behind him. He's got ancient aliens on or something. Okay, my favorite. <laughs> and he says, take a seat, Chuck. And so I sit down, and I'm scared as all hell. Yeah. 
and uh, he opens a beer for himself, slides one across the table. I'm like 16 at this point. Gives me a, a beverage and he says, drink that. So I comply. You know, I was happy to do so, yeah, I yeah, think. Sure. <clears throat> and he doesn't say anything. He just sit there. The show finishes. Commercials come on. It's probably 30 minutes later. He mutes it. And he goes, so Chuck, you've been living in my house, huh? <laughs> I go, oh, yeah, Jake helped me out. He's just doing this and this. And he goes, okay. Well, you can just come on in through the front door from now on. You don't got to go in through the back door anymore. And then I lived there for three years, the wow. rest of my high school experience. Wow. And so... Now, so you're there, and you're not with your parents. Mm -hmm. um, and you're still in high school. You, mm -hmm. Did you keep continue attending? Or? I continued attending high school. I didn't leave until the fall of what would be my senior year. At that point, I had screwed up so much my freshman and going into my sophomore year that there's no way I was going to make it out of there by May. And I was broke. I had no, I didn't know what I was going to do. So, so I went, well, I had to go to school to drop out. So I went to school that morning and I sat with my Dean and I'm like, this is what's going on. I'd hit it for a long time from everyone about everything I was going through. Cause I was scared to tell sure. them I didn't want to end up sure. in some other scenario. I didn't know what was best. So I hit it. So I'm telling all this stuff to my dean, and she's like, I can tell she's upset that she didn't know and do anything, and I was always in her office because I was in trouble mm -hmm. all the time, mm -hmm. of course. And so she set me up with the GED program. I got the GED. So I ended up earning my GED right. in that summer coming after that and basically on track with where my other peers oh, were. So. And it wasn't some time till I would attend community college. You know, I worked crappy jobs. I was a dishwasher. I was a cart pusher. You know, it was things young men do to survive. Yeah. Um, but I had good mentors. Much like yourself, I was incredibly lucky mm -hmm. to just have people that were so generous around me to just give me their time, give me their resources, make sure that I was sane, you know, because through all of this, it's turmoil and I'm depressed and sad and angry and all those things that most teenagers are anyway, and then given the circumstances, but it was through Jim just giving me the grace to exist mm -hmm. around mm -hmm. them that I started to get gratitude and know when someone was teaching me something. I learned how to, I learned how to learn through that sort of thing. Nice. And, and that changed everything. And so anytime anyone had any information or I think someone had something that I wanted to know, I just hung around them and Got made them watch. teach yeah. me. Yeah. Oh. You were great as a student in class because you did extra. You shared what you knew and you told some of the story. Yeah. Did I? I might have, yeah. I, you told us that you were, had spent some time homeless and mm -hmm. you were from a family that fell apart. Yeah. Um, and my sense is you're not responsible for the family that you're born into. Uh, they're they're yeah. supposed to be responsible for you, but they don't always do that. Right. So as a person, your job is to get yourself together. Right. Um, which seems to be what you've decided to do as a sort of career at first. Yeah. Uh, just pull yeah. yourself together and do things that you like to do and figure out what that is. And, uh, it's an awful similar story to my own. Really? I think I, without, ever, without you ever saying that, I sort of sensed uh, sort of a kindred thing. Yeah. Just in the way you speak, <laughs> your sort of cadence. Okay. I don't know. I, I, I don't, don't know. know either. I connected with you in class. I knew that. Yeah, certainly. I think because I have had other examples of people that I, that I collected, mm -hmm. you know, mentors I collected because, like I said, they had something that I wanted, right. which was usually just knowledge or some sort of insight. Um, it's made me like, all right, so the mystic part of who I think I am or I assign to myself, okay. you know, um, it's made me intuitive that way, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And um, and the empathy part of my brain is 
10 times too big, <laughs> you know, yeah. like you described. Yeah, which does make teaching a challenge because, mm-hmm. uh, it, first of all, it's uh, usually not in uh, clinical situations, not one-on-one or one-on-two or something like that. It's usually a huge classroom you have to manage. All right. And that's a whole different set of tools than right. this kind of conversation, which is probably what you enjoy most. Well, I think that I enjoy both because in the few lessons I have been able to teach, um, it's easy to connect. It will, maybe the art, the art classroom is especially easy to do those sort of things because, because students have no choice. Like, they have to be vulnerable. Like, yes. they want to make a great painting. Yes. Okay, well, listen, you start by being really bad. You start by sucking. So let's just get some stuff on the paper here and we'll figure it out. We're going to build this airplane as we fly it. And that's fundamentally how I've had to do things. And if you can just, I feel like if you can just get students to turn on to that a little bit, you know, they'll start collecting the pieces themselves. Yeah. Do you, do you yeah. know um, the children's writer, uh, Tommy DePaulo? Mm, not familiar. Uh, um, number of books about art. A uh, number of books about uh, not being allowed to bring his multiple colors to class because the teacher said you only get ten colors. And hmm. uh, he had a crayon box with lots of colors. Uh, and a lot about being a person uh, in, written in child format. You, you probably enjoy it. Um, mm-hmm. Tommy, T-O-M-I, DePaulo. Tommy DePaulo, I'll certainly yeah, look them up. I think you'll find it amusing. And they may even have it here. It's a classic stuff. Um, kind of kept my daughters going. Okay. Um, he's got one about uh, uh, Lady of Guadalupe, and he's got one about Texas uh, flowers, uh, hmm. and then he's got something called the Juggler, a bunch of interesting kinds of characters put in a situation where they have to um, use art to survive. Interesting. Yeah. I think I'll certainly enjoy yeah, that. Yeah, I think then. you will. And his, his art is wonderful, so there's that too, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he illustrates his own books. And oh, very yeah, cool. Really good stuff. So if you get a chance, uh, oh, children's will. books, but, you know, what the heck. Yeah. Uh, no, certainly anything is a great resource. Yeah. Um, I think you'd probably be great at teaching, because, uh, particularly in the arts, because mm-hmm. uh, you allow kids to be vulnerable. You don't. Uh, you don't draw umbrellas because it's April. You you open up and say what uh, what should we do to celebrate spring, and then go right. from there. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, whereas a lot of teachers are, you know, it's spring we do umbrellas and stick it up on the wall and you yeah. know that kind of art. It's different, different right. kind of art, more like craft. Certainly, and while. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. That's how I think about it. Um, even in even in the college years, art is still very craft based. You're still very much perfecting the craft of of mark making. Um, the sooner you can introduce that philosophical inquiry to a young mind, yes. the yeah, better. Absolutely, you know. And surprisingly, I sort of just had this epiphany. Maybe it's probably common sense to lots of people, but. The art room, there's very little abstraction happening, believe it or not. I think, well, I'll ask you, where do you think the most abstraction happens in the, in the classroom or in the, you know, grade school or high school? Hmm. I don't know. A lot happened in the cafeteria. (laughs) <laughs> well, the cafeteria is a contender, no doubt. Uh, but I, I believe it class. to be, yeah. I believe it to be the math room, the most abstraction happening, where where students learn to think abstractly and sort of. Oh, I see what you're saying. Like, yeah, yeah, it could be. Um, yeah. The discipline of geometry was really a challenge for me, because 
it is total abstraction. And right. when we projected it into trigonometry in my summer school class, it was quite amazing. We were creating arcs and things like that in, in the universe without any Absolutely. grounding at all. Right, and you're, you're, you're totally off on a ledge yeah. there. This entirely human creation to quantify reality, yeah. you're, you're way far out there as far as abstraction goes. In the art room, we talk about sensation, you know? True. Isn't, isn't art really figuring out how to perceive and then present? Yeah, very much. So, so It's pretty grounded in some ways, probably more I, than any other course. I think so very much because... Because when you're dealing in sensation, you know, you get to make up your own rules. You get to create your own set of laws. Like, it is whatever you want it to be. And as so long as, so long as you learn to articulate yourself in a way or create work in a way where it can land on someone else, mm -hmm. Eisner calls it a completed catch. Art is a completed catch. Yeah. Then you're successful. Yeah. Then it's a successful piece. And whatever means you use to get there is fair yeah. game. So create, create that knowledge. Go and pull from everywhere and use all of your influence to communicate what it is your, your feelings are, your sensations are. Or if you're, if you're attaching it to some political ideology or some sort of call to action, um, you know, political protest or whatever the case might be, like it's such a perfect medium to do it in. And, Studio art, of course, but all art forms, whatever it is. Music especially, you know. Mm -hmm. all, all art tries to ascend to what music is because music is so visceral. You drop, when you listen to a song and you get carried away and, you know, you, you smile or you well up because it takes you somewhere. That's the goal. That's always the goal of whatever the expression is, whatever the medium is. And I think that kids love that. I, so I know I do. Yeah. If, if you connect it to their own passions, I, I, of right. course they love it. Yeah. It's, yeah. Great. Making, getting them to act intuitively is what I think the biggest goal should be. You know? Yeah. That's, uh, Alexander in a very bad day. Um, I don't know who the author is, but in it he says, uh, the teacher didn't like my invisible castle as much as she liked somebody else's drawing. And uh, I, I love that because that, I didn't have the talent to draw, but I had the images in my mind. I right. was always horrified that it was not accepted, you know, to have it just in your mind. Or uh, I have a friend in Oregon who uh, has, a, he owns a house near the university, so he's always got students living with him. You know, he's, in, he's got five bedrooms, I think, in the house. So I was always students living there. Mm -hmm. But when I knew him, we were doing a lot of smoke and grass and standing and looking up at his house and he kept saying, there's a tower up there. And yeah. so a couple of years ago, I took my wife out to visit him and uh, he still stands out back and says, do you see the tower up there? And we wow. never did. <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, It's clear as day to yeah. him. Yeah, wow. it was kind of fun. Kind of fun. Interesting. He's also artist-based, but uh, to make a living, he does horticulture. Okay, very cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. He's a tree surgeon, among other things. Did very well until he dropped a chainsaw on his leg, which, oh, no. which took him out of the trees. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, so he does other things now. but Yeah. Uh, a lot of the generation that I was in... Um, People were trying to find new ways to make a living, to survive. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a lot of uh, community-based things that you did that sort of made you survive, you know, getting a grant or, or uh, getting a job at the park district or, you know, you, you had survival, but you also had whatever it is you're creating as your project. Right. Um, I taught swimming because that's what I was good at. So I taught swimming at the YMCA all the time, years when I was in the Army, still teaching swimming. Um, wow. But it, it was kind of the thing I could do. So right. That's what, the finance, yeah. whatever else, yeah. yeah. So I, I also was 
waiter. I was a pretty good waiter, but um, that was uh, after a day in the army. I would go wait tables to try and make enough money to keep my then girlfriend and later wife at American University, which was expensive. Oh wow! So uh, I had two jobs and I did a bus ride, and not much sleep. Yeah, I know very much about that. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, By the way, I also had a student who, junior high or middle school, left her family, came, wanted to stay at my house, stayed for about 14 days, and I explained to her that there were a lot of problems with a girl being in my house from school with right. the district knowing that you're there. So find a girlfriend who will take you in. And she did. Mm. And after 14 days, we got her into a house with another girl, her same age. Both of them are friends on Facebook still. Oh, uh, very cool. But um, she had to go through high school in somebody else's house. Same high school, same community, but... Yeah. Um, Just not without yeah. the resources of a family or a close yeah. family. And I took her yeah. down to Missouri State to go to school. She got a, a grant there. Nobody would tie her down, so I loaded my then small car with all of her junk and my two kids and off we went oh, very cool <laughs> yeah um, those are the great opportunities you know when it's when it's something as simple as opening up your door or taking a car ride that's the easy stuff yeah. and you know I'm sure it made all the world of a difference in her life and got her into everything. school and got her to stay there for a couple of semesters you know right uh, flying in the milk because she's Puerto Rican <laughs> Uh, yeah, in Missouri, yeah, of all places. Yeah. A little hard, but she yeah. stayed for a couple of years. Uh, That's yeah. good. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah very much. Um, I don't know where are we at here. So we've been talking for some time. I'm, it's been a couple oh, hours. Okay. Is there... I could keep going forever, but is there anything in particular that you would like people to take away from this conversation? Well, just the fact that we're connected um, because both of us were open to empathy. Uh, I think that's the foundation on which you can learn stuff. Uh, I think one of the problems we have is that kids are sort of silenced in school and they're just kind of sitting there absorbing, supposedly, only not. Um, and they don't, they're not valued for their humanity in a way that I think is necessary. And I think my, I had a long time in therapy uh, and my therapist said, you've got to stop trying to be adopted. There are plenty of people who adopt you anyhow, but don't go out looking for it. Uh, and I had to kind of tone down uh, the, the compassion, the wanting to be engaged Interesting. Because it was kind of overwhelming my life. Mm -hmm. um, wanting to be loved, I guess, was right. very important to me. Of course. Um, and got me into trouble females-wise, you know, because there, a lot of people want to try and love you and it doesn't mm -hmm. always work out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, certainly yeah. not. Um, so, so, I think living your life with some passion is probably the, the best thing you can do with and finding I, I love the idea that you're exploring where you're going to be what you're going to do and how to make a living with it is always tough yeah. and it's common for seniors who are going out in the world to be very challenged by the idea of oh my god I've got to make a go of it out there and the structure yeah. of, of college is so much uh, affirming the atmosphere is chaotic out there when you yeah. try and look for a job. So, uh, passion. passion. Follow your absolutely. passions. Don't hesitate to follow your passions, yeah. I suppose. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I, I love the community that I got involved with uh, in the arts community and, and 
found that there were, you know, like for instance, a, a settlement house, I hired an art teacher uh, who was able to get the kids to uh, draw and tell her experiences. She didn't stay very long, but you know, she did that and it was fun to be involved with that. Certainly. Um, teaching kids the, the skill to express themselves. Uh, it's brilliant. That's, for me, it was reading. Learning to read was Miss mm-hmm. Dosi taught me how to read, um, and with that, taught me to embrace reading and the importance of language. Absolutely. And for me, that's been my tool for life: is that use of language. Yeah. So. Well, and you've certainly passed it on <laughs> to myself, at least. Oh, good. Um. So I like to ask people this question, usually in closing, and um, there's no right answer, of course. Are there ever right answers? No, almost never. But anyway, no, it's not, it's, it's not even a matter of that. So it goes like this. Um, from the observable universe to the atom, which do you find more interesting or mysterious? The very, very big or the incredibly small? It's funny, I was doing a, a parent conference right, with my troublesome daughter. Mm-hmm. Um, she gets a lecture from her teacher because she's not doing her English. It's an English teacher. So uh, then we go to her German class and she tells her German teacher that he must have grown up in the Hitler Youth Camp because he was such a Nazi teacher. And we got asked to leave. Um, so we're walking to the car, and I'm kind of concerned what I'm going to tell her. How, to, how do I address the fact that she's basically fighting school, probably in the way I did. Mm-hmm. And she says, Dad, what the difference does all this make? all just motes of dust to float in the universe. Um, How old is she then? Hmm? How old was she at the time? Fifteen. (laughs) Fifteen. And I thought, hmm, now that's going to be something interesting to tell her mother. (laughs) 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 Uh, Motes of dust to float in the universe, I think, is kind of my idea of the world. Uh, It's huge. Possibilities are huge, um, but we are just minuscule. So it's uh, kind of up to us to connect in ways that make meaning for us. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think I'm both ends of that. It's a big universe, and, and we're little tiny dots. Right. But if you put a lot of dots together, may make a school, <laughs> you know, like fish. Right. So, I don't know. Did that answer it? That answers it perfectly, okay. very much, yeah. Um, um, you would well, like my daughter, Kim. She's quite a character. Uh, oh, really? And her sister says when she has issues, I channel Kim's voice and I can handle anything. Interesting. Because yeah. Kim is outspoken and... I took her to, <laughs> I took her to an interview at um, college in in uh, Galesburg. Pretty good college, but it's science based. And um, <laughs> in the interview, the the intake officer saying, "Well, I see that you didn't do math very well." I see you've done some remedial math. I'm glad that you um, kept at it. I I see your struggle. And we've got some more math that you're going to do here. And she (laughs) looks at the guy and says, if you think I'm doing fucking math in college, you're fucking out of your mind. (laughs) Nice. (laughs) And I thought, well, okay, we're not going to get this one. (laughs) Oh my gosh! Yeah, that's kind of how she 
was. So she ended up at uh, uh, someone downtown, uh, an art school downtown. Uh, Columbia, yeah, Columbia or SAC? That's the one. What did she study? Uh, photojournalism. Photojournalism, <laughs> okay. Very A cool. lot of pictures of uh, uh, Cabrini Green. Oh, yeah, yeah. She did the people on the train, those kinds of things. Okay. And now she's a first grade teacher? No, this is the other one. This is the older one. Okay. The first grade okay. teacher uses her. <laughs> oh, okay. I see now. Um, no, she's a mom and works at home and uh, two kids and husband who's a uh, former alcoholic like she was. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. They're good. They have a big house up in uh, Mattawa, Illinois. Okay. Yeah, up north. Yeah, way up yeah. there. Very yeah. cool. He's a construction, he owns a construction company, so he keeps the house in pretty good shape. I imagine. Yeah, yeah those guys make good money. Yeah, that's all right. Yeah. And he's talented, and sometimes you get a little nervous when he YouTubes it to figure out how to do the next job, but, you know, he, he does yeah. it. He just needs to see the procedure. Yeah. He'll, he'll finesse yeah. it, right? That's how I feel about lots of things. I had a neighbor who was repairing his car with his phone. Oh, yeah. And he's underneath the car and comes out, looks at his phone, goes back under the car. I, I was curious what he was doing. He said, learning how to put this together or that together. You know, yeah. It's all online. That's how I learned. I wouldn't have had a car when I was 18 if the Internet didn't exist because I bought a, a broken one that didn't run for very little money. So ah, you, you know, repaired it yourself? To make it go, yeah. You use YouTube or use whatever. and Cool. On a cheap car, it's easy to make lots of mistakes. Yeah. So I'm grateful for all of that valuable knowledge as well. Cool. That's, a, that's really cool. Yeah, you know, there's some perks to being broke. <laughs> yeah. It's a, a, a lifestyle, actually. Uh, yeah, I suppose so. Maybe to my detriment at this point. I doubt it. I don't know. I'm somewhat obsessive where, you know... I hate I hate buying things if I can if I can make it I'd rather just make it mm -hmm. if it takes me if it costs me five times as much and takes me twice as long I'd rather just make it yeah but then you're, it's yours right? that's right. kind of cool yes uh, certainly. Uh, we all consume stuff that we don't have a clue how it works or what it does or we right. just buy it because it's handy dandy right yeah. I try to avoid it <laughs> good idea some people some people call me crazy for it but hey that's cool what choice do I have <laughs> well you, you know? could waste your money on things you don't need. Right. Uh, I don't know. Um, yeah. My daughter, Kim, sells stuff on the internet. That's kind of her. Her. Uh, she goes to second-hand stores. And oh, repurposes yeah. them? Or, yeah. 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 That's cool. Yeah. I wish, I love that idea. You she know? has uh, people from her church who want to sell items, and so she does it. And she has an audience that's hooked, hooked on her. Um, and all my boxes from things I get delivered go to her house so she can oh, nice. send things out. That's really fun. Absolutely. Um, I forget who wrote the essay, but there's an essay that exists that says, whatever the endeavor is, you, if you should acquire a thousand true fans, then you can be successful and make a living at anything you want. So whether it be art making or repurposing things or whatever sort of business you create to bring in funds and resources to finance yourself. If you can stick with it long enough and be, term be determined through, through the process, then should you acquire a thousand true fans, you will, you'll never be wealthy, but you can continue to do it for the rest of your life. Cool. And, um, you know, um, I, I'm writing this memoir about Vietnam. Mm -hmm. I'm doing it because Bathgate told me to do it. And, mm -hmm. uh, but I, I couldn't just do it myself. Right. So I've been, I have about four or five people who are readers who are, you know, just read it and either give me a, a yay, bravo, this is cool, or mm -hmm. you might want to change this, or did you know you changed the name of a sergeant from this to this in your chapter, why don't you go back and fix it so they're all the same, that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Um, 
I find having a community to, that knows what you're about and then helps you get there has been very rewarding as a retired person. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I have a garden, so I spend most of my time doing that. But this writing stuff was kind of a challenge for me. I've been wanting to do it all my life. And while I'm gardening, it just comes. What's next? Right. What's the next part of the story? What what happened then? And how did that come together? And so right. It's been, been fun writing. Oh, I bet. Especially with that method, you know? Yeah. Keep your hands busy doing something else. And yeah, and go in and... You're sort of reflective. Tap it out or... I do both. I write in a journal sometimes. Uh, I have five, five chapters I haven't... Or um, my English friend, who's also a reader, her whole family are readers uh, of my stuff. So every time I send her one, she forwards it on to uh, her two kids and her mm -hmm. husband. Okay. Um, and they all read it and all give me feedback. Okay. Oh, very yeah. cool. Um, she said, I love your snippets. I said, snippets? She says, well, they're not chapters. They're snippets. So I've been putting snippets together. I have 48 snippets. Oh, wow. I, I would be excited to read them. Would you? Are this, is this something you want to publish? Not necessarily. No? You just want to collect them? No, well, anything? first of all, I want to get it down. Then we'll see if, right. if it reads well enough that people are interested in it, which my friends claim they are. So... Mm -hmm. I think it would be incredibly valuable to have those stories and perspectives for people to read and know. Um, I'm curious about your process, though, because as I find myself writing a lot more, you said you pen, you pen in a journal? Sometimes. First? Not always. Okay. Not always? Other times you'll sit at the computer yeah. and type? Yeah. Okay. Right now my chair at the computer is given up, so it drops all the way to the bottom. So I'm sitting in a little hole and... It's not comfortable, so I switch back to the journal because it's more comfortable. I can sit in a better chair. Okay. Um, I think we can get you well, a chair. I'm going to buy one soon. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm curious because um, in the way that I like to make things, like I said, and sort of repurpose things, I've begun to use the typewriter. Oh, cool. And I've discovered something about the typewriter, which I much prefer to, to, the, to sitting down at the computer on a you know, Microsoft Word or whatever. Um, for putting ink on paper, the typewriter is the most excellent tool because not only does it transfer thought into language, but it also captures your voice, you know, because when I type something on the computer, I, I type something out and I'd be like, oh, I met Peter this morning at 7 a.m. No, no, it wasn't 7 a.m. Actually, it was 10.30 a.m. and we were in this room like... So the way it captures your cadence and captures your voice more so, because you're not doubling back and erasing those things, right. it's slightly more transparent. And I've been enjoying that very much, when both reflecting upon it and giving it to someone. When I write with my pen, it, mm -hmm. it's more my cadence, my voice. Uh, doing it, putting it on the computer, doing it secondly. I edit it a little bit as I, uh, so yeah. it gets a little better, a little more refined that way. Um, but I, I'm more comfortable with the pen because it goes at the pace my brain goes. Right. Whereas the computer, you kind of, you kind of push yourself to do it efficiently or something. Right. This whatever it is about sitting at that machine yeah. just changes yeah. the output. Yeah. And I can sit. With, with my journal, I can sit in the backyard, my rocker, with my dogs. Right. Uh, or I can sit in the easy chair and, and still be able to compose. So, right, absolutely. So that's more fun for me. Uh, Michael uses, uh, Dr. Bathgate uses his iPad that way. He's very, very good. Uh, oh, I suppose that would be. Carries it around with him. And he's, yeah, yeah. I tried. I bought an iPad to try and keep up with him. Because he, mm -hmm. he teased me I was in the cafeteria and I had a flip phone and a desk calendar. I was writing stuff oh, wow. on my calendar and he walked and by like, and looked at me. He's so 80s. <laughs> Get with the time. Yeah. yeah. And I thought, ah, ah. <laughs> do something about that. Uh, yeah. He's the one who convinced me to be run for president of the university faculty too. So um, He's mighty persuadable. Yeah, he is. Um, I had him for uh, religious studies course in Buddhism, 
and uh, right at the very beginning of his class, I was in a motorcycle accident. Ouch. So I was behind immediately. And so he would sit with me and we would Zoom and uh, I would just get a shot of his kitchen, him and his overalls, and uh, him just sort of, you know, holding court for me. Nice. While we, caught, while we talked about the material. Yeah. So I enjoyed his course very much. That's cool. Because he took the time to know who you were, too. Absolutely. Yeah. It seems, you know what, so it seems like that has always been what I'm after. Because the only reason I ended up at St. Xavier was because Nathan Peck called me on the phone. Otherwise, I would be somewhere else. That's how I got to UIC was because Tim Shanahan said he dreamt about me being in his program. Yeah, right. And so when someone takes that sort of effort, you'd be a fool not to, not to move on. kind of yeah. chase it. Yeah. 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 So I got my Ph.D. the same day that my contract was going to be renewed or not, depending on if I had my Ph.D. Oh, so you were... So I had the committee evaluating my dissertation called the committee evaluating my work and said he's good to go wow <laughs> talk about wow. a day of pressure <laughs> I, wow that is yeah that's amazing yeah. down to the last minute yep. basically <laughs> yeah uh, it, but it was you know you're doing it while you're working it's kind of hard to keep it all together but yeah, absolutely. I think that's what's taken me, I mean, obviously not a doctor program, but just what's taken me so long is you got to have a full-time job. Yeah, you got to work. Yeah. Right. What is so. it you're working at now as a job? Right now I'm a pizza delivery boy. Oh, okay. I was working most recently as a uh, restoring homes in Oak Park. Oh, cool. So a bit of a, a bit of a carpenter, a bit of a painter, a bit of... That's what I did. Li- yeah. A little bit of everything. Um, I did, but I I was did that at lit- Northwestern to try and make a go of it. Right. It seems, I don't know, there's always, there's always a need for that kind of yeah. work and someone foolish enough to <laughs> w- want to pursue it, I suppose. I got hooked up with a, with a company, so that somebody else was making the decisions, but I, I yeah. had to learn to drywall and uh, build corners and yeah. hang doors and All complicated stuff. stuff. Yeah. yeah. And we didn't have the internet. Yeah, well, you don't have the internet when you're with a bunch of guys no. as well on a job site, yeah. so it's a lot of learning by doing, especially for me. Yeah. But it's also changed the way I make art, because I make art with a lot of those materials now. Cool. So it's neat for that reason. Yeah. And I was lucky. I ended up with I ended up working with a pretty cool company. Um, they exclusively do historic homes and museums and things. Oh, cool. So it's somewhat adjacent to what I... Do they... Do, do they do hand tools? Like, I mean, is there an emphasis on doing it the old-fashioned ways with paying if, and things like that? If the project calls for yeah. it, yeah. If there's a like restoration of a staircase we did at the whole house. Oh, lovely. So, yeah, very much in that process it was to replicate. Yes. Other times it's, you know, get the saws all and cut this shit up. <laughs> yeah. But, you know. Oh, but I both. loved uh, taking out a, uh, what they call it, a bearing wall. Mm, fun, um, you know, with hydraulics and a beam you've put in, and you pull out the wall and then listen to see if it settles. <laughs> yeah, I've been I've been around for a couple of those, and I'm always like, okay, I'm gonna I'll wait outside <laughs> when you pull that out. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that was new to me. I didn't know that people did that. <laughs> it was horrifying. It's scary, and uh, you know, some of the people in trade work are amazing. Yes. And incredibly intelligent people. Others find themselves in trade work. And they've got some skill, no doubt. They've got plenty of skill, but they don't articulate themselves so well. So when they say, I'm going to pull this out now or whatever, or hold this cord, or <laughs> careful, this is live, you know, those are the people I was always hesitant to want to work yeah. with because they wouldn't hesitate to uh i watched a football player drag a uh, drywall knife through an electric wire shoot himself across the room mm. that was uh pretty exciting yeah i've uh, had a couple of close calls like that myself you know you wake up and you can't feel your arm and everything's a little numb and a little dizzy yeah, yeah. um it slowed him down <laughs> oh yeah oh, right yeah. across the room i mean right next to me we, we were taking out a wall and it, right. he didn't wire, he didn't see. Right. Through plaster, whole plaster. It's 
scary. Yeah. yeah, you gotta be careful with that yeah. stuff. In Evanston, everybody wants it restored or or changed. We did a lot of mm-hmm. condo conversion from apartments. And yeah. Well, Evanston's a really old neighborhood, yeah. so a lot of those houses are probably in the turn of the century. Yeah. And a lot of mm-hmm. wanted pegs and you know, no nails and that kind of stuff is challenging, fun. Yeah. You learn stuff. Yeah, I certainly learned a great deal doing it. Good. I'm grateful for that time yeah. there. You know. I remember when I got the job, my wife, my mother called me and said, you have a hammer in your hand? Mm-hmm. How could that be? But she's the same woman who said, when she saw me the last time, uh, oh, I see your body has finally grown into that fat head of yours. Oh, wow. <laughs> Oh, my gosh. Oh, Mom, I love you. <laughs> I love you dearly, Mother. <laughs> yeah, that's why I yeah. don't think you're responsible for the parents that you, you got. Yeah. You have to find a way to free yourself from some of the uh, things that happened to you, mm-hmm. but you don't have to ever apologize for the parents or the life. Or, you know what I mean? I know that now. Yeah. You know, but you don't know that when In you're... In the midst of it. Yeah. yeah. It's very hard. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know... Again, motes of dust loose in the universe. Parents get together in most bizarre ways, and sometimes it just plain doesn't work. Yeah, very much. Yeah. Very much so. And there you are, a mote of dust out there, thinking, huh, how did I get here? Right. Yeah. 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 And I know there are people who are raised with uh, strong families that they know they're going to go into the same business their dad's in or something like that, but... Mm-hmm. I didn't have any of that. Yeah, I I was sort of envious and still am sort of envious of those individuals. There's some here, quite a few here, who are here because their dad said they had to be or their mom said they had to be. And, mm-hmm. and they're paid for. And all right. they do is follow through. You know what? And I commend their efforts. So long as it's something they want to do, yes. alongside of their parents' wishes. But also... And I'm, because these students are my peers, yes. I get I get the luxury of calling them out, because when I know a students, when I know they're being financed by their parents, and they should be passionate about this work they're doing, and they slack, yeah. I have I love saying, "What the hell are you doing?" You know, <laughs> I spent ten more hours on this project than you did, and. And all the while, you had all this free time and all these resources. Yeah. And I have to come up with time limits, yeah. Right. So I love doing that because because I get the luxury. I, I of got to do that in the PhD program too because there yeah. were people there who um, were on a free ride. Yeah. And they didn't come in with the passion that you'd expect in a program. Um, right. We were all educators, so uh, there was some sense that as educators, you ought to take it on seriously. So, um, Very much. When there were people who didn't, you messed with them. <laughs> yeah, as you should. Yeah. You know, because the people who do take it seriously, you know, I don't earn any income from doing this, but I treat it like work, you know. Absolutely. I make sure I show up in the morning, make sure I'm prepared, and yeah. because I enjoy it, for one, but also because the fear and anxiety of coming to, you know, coming to class or, or asking someone to speak with me and not having something to say or contribute, like, what the hell am I doing here? pretty good at that, though. Having to do these so. things, you have quite a bit to say and can pull a lot out of people. I, I, uh, I've had a lot of practice. Yeah. I've, I've been doing this for a long time, long before there's ever microphones or a camera. Oh, cool. You know, like I told you, I, I would find mentors and yeah. drag me too. out of them. Okay. Yeah. It's become a skill. Yeah, it has. Uh, it, and like my therapist said, just don't make it a uh, kind of an illness or you, you yeah. push into too hard to get adopted, right? Right. Because you lose track of who you are if you're busy performing for others. That was my issue. Mm-hmm. I kind of lost where I was going. I imagine, though, you were always in search of your authenticity, yeah. whether or not you were maybe neglecting yourself by helping others. It was always sort of in an effort to be authentic, yeah. I imagine. Yeah. And you're, you're just caught in their stories, but you can get 
waylaid along the way. If you, if mm -hmm. you so it's better here because I didn't, I don't have, there's not the need at a college level. Kids are pretty much on their own. Right. Not, they don't ask you to be their life guide, you know, whereas, right. whereas kids who are going through a disruption in their family and come to you and say, get me through this, you know, you've got a whole thing to deal with, right? That's how we ended up with Vanessa at our house. Um, right. Complicated. Complicated. And, um, and my wife was never happy when Thanksgiving I went uh, to pull a couple of kids out of jail who had been shoplifting or my students who couldn't call their parents because they'd get killed. Right. So I left Thanksgiving dinner to go pick them up from jail and my wife was not pleased. Yeah. I mean, it's her duty as a wife to be angry at you. Yeah, I suppose. Leave yeah. in that sense. But um, I don't know. That's a whole other thing. Romantic relationships. Yeah. You know, I don't even know where to well, begin. Well, that's, yeah, that's, that's complicated. That's so complicated. Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> I've only been married four times. So only only four times? Four, yeah. Oh, so, okay. Um, you know. You've got lots of practice. Yeah, though. some practice. Yeah. You can probably anticipate things pretty well at this point. <laughs> yeah, a little better. Uh, this yeah. one's 20 years, so. Yeah. Oh, okay. So we've at least got that down. You got a good format, <laughs> then. <laughs> it works. Yeah. yeah. I had to make a lot of room for not being there, and, you know, because yeah, you're busy doing other things. And so she had to figure out how to amuse herself. And, yeah. Um, and it's worked. And as retired, she's, she rides horses, and I ride. And we do very well sharing what we've done, you know. Yeah, very yeah. good. So those things exist; they do, you know. I find, uh, despite all of the uh, things in my life, I'm still a hopeless romantic. Yeah, you know. Me too. I read, you know. So, yep. like I said earlier, my whole heart goes into whatever I'm doing. Yeah, so I imagine your love life is rather invested too, and kind of painful. Ah, <sighs> somewhat. Yeah. Somewhat, yeah. Yeah. But so goes it. I have no choice uh, to do the things I'm compelled to do. Probably how you felt. Yeah. And... And I kind of have always had a sense that I'm who I am. And, you know, I had the wife that wanted to make me somebody different. Yeah. And that doesn't work doesn't work. You can try it for a little yeah. bit, but it doesn't That's really work. That's what I tried for a little bit and mm -hmm. gave it up. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. I still remain kind of consistently the same boy that, you know, left Westport and, and yeah. moved to California and had to figure out how to get along with crazy people. California's different. Yeah. The whole world was different. So... One of the other memoirs I'm working on is the early childhood period. I, I call it Peter's story. And mm -hmm. I, I use my name, but um, I tell it as though I'm a third person, right? So Peter did okay. this, and Peter did that, and Peter did the other thing. And that's kind of fun. Right? And it's about childhood, so it's, and, I, and it's from memory, but I can, mm -hmm. I'm able to sort of make it Peter's story, not my story, you know? Right, I like yeah. that. So... And where are you at in those? You've collected those, many of those. Yeah, I have about ten nice. of those is all. But, okay. but the, I know where I'm going with that one. But the Vietnam one is more compelling right now. So I right. want to get that done first. Certainly. Yeah. It, well, yeah, certainly. I did the other. I started doing it for my grandkids. And then um, my daughter said, Dad, these are too hard to read. The kids don't know what you're talking about. So... Um, I stopped doing it for them and started doing it for myself. Okay, very good. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure reflecting upon that part of your life now in these moments is, I don't know, it's, it's I'd be curious to see how you were, th were thinking as a young, very young man and sort of the um, conclusions you've drawn about what you were thinking yeah. No, at this uh, point obviously, right. memory is not a reliable narrator, um, mm -hmm. but it's quite pleasurable to 
recreate and to give some direction to a life that probably lived without direction, you know. Yeah, certainly. So the story begins to take on its own uh, forward movement. And then it's just a matter of putting in the pieces that come to you as you're writing them. Right. But my life at the time, I don't think had a forward move. <laughs> it was just random. <laughs> right. You're, you're just experiencing everything at that yeah. point. Yeah. yeah. And as a little guy, you're experiencing, you know, the newness of hot sand and the excitement of tar burning your feet and, you know, that yeah. kind of stuff. So that's, that's those, fun to go back to. Yeah, those, those small boyhood victories yeah. of things yeah. like that. Yeah. And how things smelled and, you know. Right, yeah. A, a lot of that, because you know, I worked on the coast, so there was all kinds of smells that were different. And, um, yeah. And I had a neighbor who had a dog that was, uh, thought he was a person, and followed me around everywhere I went. And so I, I had his yeah. dog and... <laughs> you were fast friends, yeah. you and the dog. Yeah. yeah. And we would go to the beach and I would play in the sand and he'd tunnel and build water passages and, Spend hours just the two of us. Right. Um, also, I had a rowboat that I, we found. Uh, probably belonged to somebody, but we found it and salvaged it. My brother was all into it. There's laws of salvage. You know, we can get away with this. Yeah. Right. So we, we brought it home, put it on. Uh, we took parking lot. Uh, what are those things called? Those A-frame things that you... Oh, like the uh, horses. barricades, yeah. or yeah, saw yeah. horses. So we yeah, yeah. took those from the parking lot, put the boat up, caulked it, painted it with leftover house paint that all of the kids in the neighborhood contributed. So it was kind of an odd brown. <laughs> wow! Yeah, just a mix. Yeah. and then went out and went out to sea, you know? paddled it yeah. around. Very cool. Yeah. It was really neat. Um, till the owner came. Oh, yeah, and said, hey, what, that boat looks familiar. What did you do to the boat? Daddy, why is it that color? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> thought they painted it white again. <laughs> mm. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. yeah. All right. I have a... Um, I'm sorry. No, I'm, I'm just I was going to say, I have a, I have a similar story. Um, my friends and I constructed this cabin in the woods. Oh, cool. It's made of found and borrowed construction materials. Okay. And that was sort of the beginning of uh, myself and all of my very close friends' artistic endeavors because it gave us a place to escape to. Yeah. So, you know, we, we got a stereo out there. And cool. And it's an installation. It's an installation. Yeah. It turns out it was an installation all this yeah. time. Yeah. Cool. And that's grown into something wholly new. So we've been putting on this music festival. I've been helping to put on this oh, music wonderful. festival now. This will be the tenth year. Wow! Of doing it, and it's grown from our friends' bands just performing together to now forty bands over the weekend with forty artists. In, Holy tamale! You know, a thousand plus attendees. On this piece of land that you've got a cabin. In? Yep. So how many people come? Um, I think the most we've ever had in a weekend is maybe fifteen hundred, fifteen, eighteen hundred people, something like that. It's a big deal. It's turned into a big deal. Does it you know, make it's money for anybody? Um, we, we, especially my friend Ben, have only ever lost lots of money doing it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think Ben alone has probably spent fifty or sixty thousand dollars of his own money as a young man to facilitate yeah. all of this. And then any proceeds that have that we do make, he we always give back to the Chicago Performing Arts okay. Foundation. Okay. And um, this just grew out of kids hanging out, I love listening it. to music. I love it. You know, so those are my those are my first adopters. Where been some years older than me, he's maybe three or four years older uh -huh. than me. And so I found myself hanging out with older kids right yeah. away because I had, had I had already had that perspective. But they were good people, you know. Yeah. And uh, music has always been a big pull. I learned to play guitar. I taught myself to play guitar. Nice. And. Um, through that, it's been that has been the conduit for everything else and anything else really. Nice. We call it DZ Fest. Easy. D DZ. DZ. Yeah. Interesting. Just some boyhood boyhood gibberish yeah. turned into a big deal. That yeah. is a big deal. 
That's very nice. Yeah. And you, the Chicago Arts support you too. I mean, we just you just write them a check. Oh. Uh, a friend of mine, a friend of mine. She was a graphic design. She studied graphic design. She did something in an administrative role at CPS, and that sort of was how we facilitated that at first. Mm-hmm. And now it's just a matter of like we send a couple emails and cool. yeah, off it goes. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Yeah. But I, I, I always think of teaching as a stepping stone rather than as the ultimate goal. Um, either money for family or money for a life, but you got to have the mm-hmm. life part. And right. That was where the middle school was interfering with the life part. Uh, because mm-hmm. I over engaged in a way that was taking all my time, um, so I dropped out of art communities that way and lost track of my artist friends. But, right, which was, I think, a sadness. Uh, yeah, certainly. I reestablished some of them. My first wife and I are good friends now. Um, My kids are pretty engaged in what they're doing, so it's kind of fun. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah I find those relationships to be the most beneficial. Yeah, I just yeah. I love that you created music and have a place to do it and, and built an installation and didn't even right. know you were doing that as an art form. We got lucky. Yeah. We got lucky in that sense, too, because it's on my friend's parents' property, and just the, just the other night... Um, he told me how he thinks that they're the best judge of character he's ever met in anyone, his two parents, because why else would you allow 10, 15 kids to just take over your house and live in your backyard in in a sense? And, you know, um, they're very interesting people. Near Peoria, if you take the river road down into Peoria off of 80, there was a teepee in the woods that um, somebody was living in smoke and stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, Giant teepee, really big one. Um, And who knows who lived there, but it was always intriguing to me that it was on some farm property that probably the family let them be there. Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, I don't know. That's fun stuff. Get lucky in that way. So, yeah, we were were incredibly lucky for that way because... uh, the history and arc of their whole family to open up their door to all of us kids was also, you know, incredibly influential yeah. for me and for all of you us. You were going to tell me about uh, the man who let you stay in the basement. Oh, that suicide. was that was Jim. Did he commit suicide? He uh, he did commit suicide. He uh, some years later, um, some years later, he committed suicide. He shot himself in the chest. Um, wow. Yeah, so when that happened, I had lived away for about a year at that point, and, um, or I had been mo- moved out from their house for about a year. They had also moved, and he had been remarried. And at that point, he had three, three kids, my friend Jake, and they had two sisters. He had two sisters. And they were all grown, they're all in college, or or I'd finished college. Jake was still in college at the time. And um, I don't know. He always, he was always an uh, incredibly emotional person. Um, He had had one marriage fail. At this point, he was probably in his mid-60s when he remarried Hmm. and everything fell apart for him or the marriage fell apart for him again. So, and you know, similar to like you said, I saw him the day before and I would, I would never, at that time, I, I had only seen him a couple times over the last year after moving out, and um, I was working at a bike shop at the time, okay. and we would go get lunch at this deli down the street, and I would always grab a bike from the shop and ride down there, and um, it's a deli, but it's also a courtyard, and this is where he got married to his most recent wife, yeah. and I'm hesitant to talk about it, because it's, it's just speculation in my mind, but there... I think it was the the driving force was them not getting along. Yeah. But when I saw him the day before, I was ecstatic and I gave him a hug and I asked him 
how everything's going and what's up and, you know, how are you doing and all that. And we just, we sat and we, we ate together and it was just as pleasant as ever. And then he went about his day. I went about my way, my, my day, my way. And, um, the next afternoon I'm at work and Jake calls me and he can't talk cause he's in tears. Oh my God. How painful is that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, incredibly. And, uh, you know, he was the first and probably most important father figure after everything that happened to me. So I was distraught myself. I'm sure. And um, I don't know. I suppose I haven't really... I should have a long time ago really sat with that one, but I I've been kind of hesitant saving that yeah. one oh, for a better headspace yeah. to start to pick through yeah. it. Um, because I'm not happy to talk about it, but I've thought of suicide myself. Yeah, me too. At times in my yeah. life, you know. And the thing that has held me back is actually I was. Um, my wife had had an affair and was not sure she wanted to be with me anymore. Um, and the affair was really about not being with me, not so much that she needed the other guy. She didn't like the other guy that much. But, um, but used him to seriously knock me down. Right. And um, I had held her against the wall with my hands under her throat, thinking it was the end of her. I was so angry, and mm -hmm. my daughter walked in and said, Dad, what are you doing to Mom? So I put her down, and I was lying on the couch, and I got a butcher knife, and I figured I'd do a Harry Carey kind of thing, you know, just um, end it, because it, everything had fallen apart, families, you know, I knew I was going to have to move out, and mm -hmm. it just was horrible horrible to me and a friend from California called me that night and said think what that would do to your kids if they found you on the couch with a knife in your heart yeah. just think about the survivors and that stopped me I, th I think the yeah. fact that this friend is out of the blue called me also was kind of like Yikes. I do have other people in my life who like me and care about me. Right. But not being cared about enough to try and work out the marriage was so dismal to me. And I, I was here teaching. It's very hard to come in and teach every day. Um, and one of my friends here said, you know, we could get the kid kneecapped. And I, he was connected to the same community that I had come from and uh, it was so hard not to go along with that and for a while I carried an ice pick mm -hmm. I figured when I got the chance I would do him in mm. and slowly I owned it that it was about me and her not about him but it was so hard so hard yeah absolutely um. and I still you know I, my friend had committed suicide about six months prior to that. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was a professor at Princeton and Stanford. And he flew back and forth between the two. And he was in a think tank in Stanford um, and was doing sleeping pills, which was probably what caused him to have really strange dreams. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, Having had the, him as an example, it was easy to think I could do this. Right. I didn't. I'm glad. So, I wouldn't be here talking to you. I know. No, we're all glad. And uh, I know how overwhelming those feelings are because of, I've been deep in that myself yeah. for years of my life, really where it's, you just sort of carry it around with you yeah. and um, you just kind of are faking life. You're sort In of just faking. Ways, yeah. 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 
Life is theater. Life is theater, very much. And I'm, I've also attempted, or been close to attempting as well, um, before any of this other stuff happened. But, um, yeah, it's the moments when you feel there is nothing or no one or anybody. And like how you said, the need and want to feel loved and belonged like you do belong. Yeah. It's interesting because my uh, friend in England, who's my reader, um, contacted me almost immediately and said, your daughters love you. And they love you in a way that nobody else can love you. Right. So whatever you do, don't move far away from them. I was all set to move down here. I lived in Evanston. I was all set to move down here because uh, mm -hmm. everything had collapsed. And I thought, oh, well, get a crummy little apartment over on 111th. And I, I right. looked at it. It was over the train tracks. It was perfectly ugly. And I thought, mm -hmm. huh, that's where I'll be. And, yeah. And my English friend said, you know, don't move away from your kids. Be near them. So I got an apartment. Uh, six blocks from them and uh, got them every other weekend and now they're my best friends right and um, I think it's so important to have good support like that or to be lucky enough to have support like that because in those moments you're not thinking you're thinking selfishly you're thinking irrationally you, and it's hard to see any sort of future the, the fact that I chose an ugly apartment down here suggests well, I was punishing myself too. You right. Know, I was going that, to be over the railroad tracks and be it's just an ugly place and then drive over here to work, you know. Right. But that sort of self deprecating behavior that you're exhibiting was very much a a side effect of your mindset yeah, at the time. Absolutely. You know. And I know and like you do now like you do as well to have someone pick up the phone and call you and tell you to just sort you out, you know, to just tell you, listen, okay, mm -hmm. you're not thinking right now, so I'm going to do a little thinking for yep. you kind of thing. It's invaluable and... Uh, Saved my life. Yeah, yeah very much. <laughs> it's funny. Uh, the QAnon crowd live in my neighborhood too. And oh, yeah. the guy behind me is all about weapons, loves weapons. And... Uh, so when he finally got a chance to talk to me, he was excited. I'd been in Vietnam, and what was the best weapon you had? And so he was, you know, he was going on and on about how I was going to have to fight the, what was the other group that uh, doesn't exist that they? I don't know. The Q yeah, I know, yeah, the Q Yeah, but there's this other, the yeah, this other strange group that they claimed existed that they were going to come, and I needed to fight them and. What weapons was I planning to use? And, you know, on and on like that. And I finally f turned to him and I said, you know, the knife was my best weapon because it's quiet in the night. And he said, shit. I went home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you scared him plenty. <laughs> that, that whole thing blows my mind. And, uh, I refuse to do any research and do it. Yeah. Because it's so... I can't, I can't even want to get started on that one. <laughs> yeah. That one's ridiculous. It is. It's, it's so own. weird. And he's such a... You know, he's got the American flag out. And, and yeah. Don't tread on me flag. And, you know, right. Trump for 2024. Yikes. It's such misguided conspiracy. Because <laughs> yeah. there's, there's validity to other conspiracies, you yeah. know. And it's like, what the hell is this one operating on? It's just pure ridiculousness. Yeah, it seems to be. Uh, now yeah. they were saying that Kennedy is going to return and make Trump president. What the hell are they thinking? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah, so I, I just was glad he, he kind of moved back to his neighborhood and right. left me alone. You know, we're, we're, right. we're back to back, you know. Uh, and we, he asked me if he could put a fence up. And I said, absolutely. <laughs> Please, God, yes. <laughs> So this summer he's going to put a fence up. That's great. Good. Says it's for privacy reasons. I said, that's wonderful. Yeah, whatever you need. <laughs> put that fence up. 
That's so funny. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes you fall back on the acting that you learn to do, you know. And well, it's in those moments it becomes poetic yes. because you get to draw from all of that those things and use as a tool finally, yeah. even if it's just to just, just just to intimidate a little bit. <laughs> yeah. You certainly are in the right, absolutely. Yeah. One of the things that happened in Vietnam that I'm still trying to figure out how to deal with was I had a prisoner and I was putting him into a helicopter to uh, get him up to interrogation in, in uh, Saigon. And um, the gunner stuck his uh, M16 in my passenger's mouth and said, don't worry, I'll pitch him out at 3,000 feet. And I, <laughs> I pulled my 45 out of my holster and stepped into his helicopter and said, you'll have to throw me out too. And we rode <laughs> to Kanto, which is the next big city, um, with my 45 against his temple and his M16 in my prisoner's mouth. God knows what the prisoner was thinking, you know. And we got to Kanto, and I said, thank you very much for the ride, and I took my prisoner out of his helicopter. This is the gunner. There was still a pilot and co-pilot in the damn thing, but yeah. this is what the gunner was doing. And so as we step away from the uh, helicopter, I hear the machine gun drop into place and the belt go in. And I turn and look at him and say, kill me and you will be in such deep caca, you'll be in prison for the rest of your life. So think clearly, soldier. Wow. <laughs> and I wonder how that, who did that? <laughs> Who's that person who stood there and just said, death doesn't bother me? Right. Who did that? How did I get there? That's so amazing. Yeah. You know? But just the product of your environment at the moment. I suppose, yeah. Yeah. Theater. Theater. Yeah. It's survival. Yeah, I needed to really. be that person in order to survive. And when I saw um, Apocalypse Now, when they, the guy needs fuel and they're not going to give it to him, yeah. uh, he just takes it, basically. Yeah. Um, I kind of felt like I had done that in a number of cases. You know, just all of a sudden bulldog through, scared the bejesus out of whoever it was I was supposed to be working right. with. I'm curious, um, what did you think of that movie? Because that's sort of the default. Of course. Before. Yeah. And yeah. many of the things in there were things that I saw the edge of. I had a friend who did the roulette in the, um, in the opium dens with the, you know, taking bets. And yeah. That's how he made a living for a while. You lose some time when you do that. And then, so he was only an acquaintance because he went away. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I don't think I told you, but the end of my Vietnam experience, I was invited to Saigon to the headquarters of my uh, the Phoenix Project. Mm -hmm. And I walked in and there were two generals, two or three civilians, all smoking cigars and drinking whiskey. And they said, how would you like to go to Cambodia? And I said, Cambodia is neutral. They said, mm-hmm, but we need somebody there. And here's what we can do. You go there, you'll run a unit like the one you've got in Chukwu, um, and we can, you can take a female with you. We can report you missing to your family uh, and you'll be part of us. And you'll have a Swiss bank account and you'll be making about seven times the money you're making now. And I was 22. And I said, you know, this is a lot. So they said, fine, stay overnight. So I go up to my room the very first girl I met in Vietnam, I'll send you the story, uh, was a kid. She was 16, and she wanted to be my wife because she wanted to get out of Vietnam. and you know, So she was willing to do anything, but I didn't do anything. Somehow, 
they had found her, and she was waiting for me in the room upstairs to help convince me to go to Cambodia with her. Interesting. No idea how that happened. The whole CIA stuff really makes me nervous. So I talked to her, apologized for the earlier times I'd turned her down and turned her down yet again. Mm-hmm. Uh, I said I was married and I did want to go home with my wife and I really didn't think I wanted to go missing. Um, I wasn't quite sure what life they were talking about, but it didn't sound like mine. Mm-hmm. So the next morning I go back down and the same men are there, all smoking cigars, no whiskey in the morning. Uh, and they said, so what do you think? You know, and they had laid out a pretty nice package for me. And I said, you know, I think I'm not going to do it. Um, I don't think my mother and my wife would appreciate the missing in action. And um, I just think it's not right for me. I said, soldier, you're AWOL. You're absent without leave. You're on your own. Get out of here. So I walked away, went back to my, I had to hitchhike back using helicopters, what have you, to my unit to discover that nobody was speaking to me in my unit anymore. I was a persona non grata. And uh, spent my last month in Vietnam with nobody speaking to me except Vietnamese friends. It was bizarre. Just bizarre. I can't even wrap my head around that. Uh, I don't know enough about the military to understand what what's happening there. What what do they want you to do in Cambodia? Basically run a, uh, we call it a district coordinating center uh, operations and gather intelligence and eliminate people. Okay. That's what I was doing. That was so that's job. why, that's why your identity had to be changed then for you to be. They wanted me to be permanent with the CIA. I would come out of the military and transfer into the CIA. Why, why do you think they asked you to do it? I had a good record. Okay. And they had read my false documents. Okay. So I looked very different than I was. Right. Um, and good, ad, good recommendations from the people above me based on their idea of what I should do or what I would be or whatever. Yeah. Uh, 22 years old, new life, start over, have a lot of money, uh, have a f- new account and be a CIA person for the rest of your life. And it was kind of an intake for being the spy that you read about in seven, sure. 007 novels, you know, and that stuff, which, of course, I'd read like everybody else, you know, my age group, you know. Mm-hmm. It was a chance to be a superhero. Yeah. But I think, like you said, you quickly identified that it wasn't your life. Yeah. 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 At 22, it was a tough call. Yeah, certainly. Um, There were lots of appeals. Uh, How they, I was horrified that they had found the same girl that I had hung with my first month in Vietnam. How did they, how did they know? It makes me wonder if she was almost placed. Yeah. Initially. That's what I wondered, too. But then yeah. I, I it, it made my life too scary. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that when I came back to the States, I was pretty paranoid. Oh, I bet. I thought there were people out there wanting to get me. It was, I, felt, I got followed. I got my phone tapped. I had things going on that I did not understand. That's crazy. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. When did you start to feel some sense of normalcy? 16 years of therapy. 16 years after returning? Yeah. My gosh. Every week. Uh, how do you know when the therapy's finished? I don't know. He said the bear would roll the ball out from a statue that he had. And it did. I don't know how he did that, but one day I came in and the ball was in the middle of the floor. Interesting. The bear did it. Interesting. Yeah. He was a wonderful man. He was a Jungian. Uh, I don't know if you know Carl Jung. Uh, a little bit spiritual. 
kind of um, an interesting psychology, a little different from uh, Freud and that stuff, because okay. he's more interested in a lifespan and in what happens beyond therapy and uh, not so much what your family was like and all the early stuff that you how to blame your parents, et cetera. Right. Much more about uh, you're somehow in tune with the universe. How do you, how, you're that mode of dust. How do you make a place for yourself? Right, right. Uh, so that's Carl, Carl Jung. Jung. Yeah. Okay, I'm vaguely familiar yeah. with him. I've read some of it. Uh, I didn't read much of it, but having a Jungian who, he was also the head of the Jungian Center in Evanston, so he was on the radio and did, and did plays and stuff. He was a week. I saw him at the Goodman. Uh, he was um, see, the the Arizona or desert artist who does big flowers, Georgia O'Keeffe. George O'Keefe. He was Georgia O'Keeffe's husband in the movie, in the play. Oh, yeah. really? Uh, oh, yeah, my gosh. It was a really interesting kind of thing. Um, you want to share his name? Yeah. Uh, um, Lee Roloff. Lee Roloff. Yeah. I think there's a lot of stuff on the internet about him, too. Is he still living? No. He uh, moved to California, had a radio show out there for a while. So I haven't. I didn't search afterwards because he and I made an agreement that it was time for me to grow up and move on. Sure. So we, we did. Right? Very good. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's so much to unpack. Yes. Because... <sighs> Yeah, every every week for um, and he uh, didn't want anything in the books about me, so he charged me fifty bucks a visit, and we'd go for an hour, hour and mm -hmm. a half, mm -hmm. um, end with a hug or a punch in the chest or you know something, right? Body contact. Uh, he was a professor of speech at uh, Northwestern. Uh, and did this on the side. He was brilliant. It was really fun. Yeah. Um, and saved my life, too. You know? Wow. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. And 16 years with a break in the middle. A uh, break came when somebody at my school who was supposed to be my mentor got arrested for diddling my students. And I needed help. Because I was good friends with him, and mm -hmm. so there was, of course, the sense that I probably was doing it too. Wow. Yeah. How do you even begin to <laughs> to yeah. to walk that one back? That's uh, so. How did you get yourself out of that one with them, assuming that you were helping facilitate and also yourself? Molesting it was, um, I think the worst was when uh, Angel uh, was, I, I'd taken him to the police because he was one of the kids that was molested. Mm -hmm. And a um, policeman said to him while I'm standing there, how often did you, did he bother you? How often did he mess with you? And he turns and looks at me and says, how often did you send me to the office? Oh, my and I just, I burst into tears. I, I just couldn't believe it. it was, That's heartbreaking. It was, yeah, it was three years after that that I left. I couldn't, I couldn't do it anymore. I'd done my, my stint in the middle school, and I had to reclaim my identity, and it was really hard going. There were still, when I left, there was a janitor who was still sure I was doing the same thing. And, he would say so to people. It was always that underlying, you know. And at one point, they had me keep track of every kid I had contact with outside of the classroom. Yeah. That was every kid. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, yeah. My gosh. I mean, my gosh. Especially especially knowing that you were doing all these things so s selflessly, like spending time with students and getting involved in their lives, to be accused of that I, is so belittling and so heartbreaking. It was, and it was really heartbreaking because 
four or five of the boys that were involved were also hanging with me all the time. Right. Because they were looking for a new father, you know. And, mm -hmm. and he was my mentor teacher when I got, and he was vice principal when, when he got caught. His wife turned him in. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. She recorded the kids at, at the house. The money, spank them and play with them. And the stuff that I can't even imagine. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. It was all boys. That's terrible. Yeah. And it was all the vulnerable boys. So they're the ones that came to me, you know, the little rowdy kids that nobody else wanted, right? Right. Um, and I, who knows how long it had been going on. He had been a sixth grade teacher for a long time. And, uh, probably his whole career and before then possibly, even. Possibly, yeah. Yeah. Um, it was just... It was just devastating to me and Absolutely. took away a lot of my enthusiasm for teaching because I was just, you know, you can't, you can't trust your own um, reputation to protect you, you know. Right. You think you're doing everything the right way, above board and, and that, giving all yeah, your time. The, the, they see it as a crime. Potential. You're grooming. That's what they called it. I mean, it's sick that it exists this way, but it's also to be accused of it and be unaware is the worst crime. the The worst of the two crimes. It feels because just given how how big your heart was yeah. and how you felt. Uh, that. Uh, grooming is such an interesting thing because I think when you you know their kids in trouble mm -hmm. and you shoulder up to them and kind of guide them back to reality or you know out of yeah. the mess they're in or whatever yeah is that grooming uh, I sp it, no it's not yeah. it shouldn't be it should be because your destination isn't what what his right. was but um, on the other hand you really want the kids to take heart from you, use your heart to carry them through. Right. Yeah. Complicated. It's very complicated with middle schoolers particularly. In my mind, more now than ever. Sorry. No, no, don't be sorry. Absolutely not. But it just makes me sick. Yeah. You know? That's what the first reaction is. I just threw up. Yeah more than once I mean when I discovered when kids would come and tell me I was a victim too yeah ah! <laughs> yeah I it's those it's those moments and those stories that make me feel diminished because I give everyone such benefit of the doubt that everyone's got Everyone has everyone's best interest in mind. Wish they least did. Yeah. I like to think so anyway. Yeah. I, Sometimes I feel I have to believe they do, but when you hear someone like this, an administrator who has turned their career as the conduit to do these deplorable things, I just it it it, it sort of destroys the whole hierarchy, a whole entire hierarchy in my mind. Because how can someone ascend to the a level of a role like that he, by just... He even went to principal school at Harvard. Uh, and it's just, I mean, he's very smart. A Northwestern yeah. graduate. Um, but this thing creeped underneath him and yeah. I don't know that he was in control. Probably yeah. not. That's a whole... That's a whole other thing itself, you know, the sort of mindset to get into that. He's probably was homosexual but never expressed it or was came to terms with yeah. it and so it turned into this very tumultuous destructive yep. sort of behavior and, and so to be accused of that and to know you've been with the same kids and others and to have people think that maybe you're doing it too I needed my therapist back so I went back to my therapist to Said, right. let's let's keep track of what really happened. Right. Do, you need do them not to connect to that person. You're not that person. 
Or, and I, I had trouble. It was really hard to hold on to um, my career. Yeah, certainly. That's another moment where things are probably quite literally falling apart around you. Mm-hmm. The work you've been doing just diminished by... Yeah, and it's interesting because the summer before it happened, before it became public, um, I had had a series of dreams that an earthquake had hit Lincolnwood and had mm. shaken up families and pushed people out of their homes, and, uh, mm-hmm. like the San Francisco earthquake in my vision, in my dreams. Yeah. And so Lee, being a union, said, "Woo, you know, mm-hmm. pre- what do they call it? Predilection. It's going to happen." Right. something bad happening and it's shaking up your world. Right. So I must have sensed what he was doing. Mm-hmm. Because I had the same kids, you know, so I was probably getting messages and didn't know it. Likely. Because yeah. I really was innocent. I had no sense that anybody would do that. I mean, it's not normal to think that you have to look for that sort of thing, really, especially with a colleague of yours yeah. in that role. So we had... <laughs> uh, they put me in charge of sex ed. Oh, wow. Um, second year at the uh, school, you know, sex ed for seventh grade boys. That was then at Cicero still? No, I'm no, sorry, at Lincolnwood then? Yeah. In Lincolnwood. Okay. Um, I had to have an hour of sex ed a week. Okay. Uh, so... Nobody wanted to do it, of course, nor did I. Um, yeah. So I started by saying, any questions? Right. Boy raises his hand and he says, why do men your age like to stick their penises up boys' butts? And I, I, that was my first question, right? Yeah. I got this group of probably 40 boys, maybe yeah. more. And <laughs> I was just stunned. I had no, I said, I no idea. <laughs> Cannot answer that question. Yeah. But I didn't refer him to get help. Because hmm. he was a disruptive kid and he knew he was asking a tough question. But. Was there some. Yeah, was he asking for help? Yeah. He told me that uh, being in my class was like being with his grandmother. It was safe. Yeah. So likely he was asking for help. And he probably had something going on at home that Mm -hmm. he couldn't figure out. Wow. Yeah. That kind of stuff is so hard and you don't know what to do. The kids will tell you they're going to commit suicide. What do you do then? You have to report it. Yeah. I reported it. My social worker said, you stirred the pot, you deal with it. And so I called the superintendent. My wife was a psychiatrist, a psychologist, I mean. And she said, this has got to go up the chain of command. So I called the, uh, and told on the social worker. Yeah. And so then I was persona non grata with that whole crew of people. And uh, that's just weird stuff in schools. Yes. And kids don't get help. You know, they have these horrible things going on, and nobody wants to know. Mom's the word. Why do you think that is? Because it's complicated and hard to deal with. Yeah. And because, you know, what am I going to do? Adopt them? You do want to. But can you? No, not everyone. No, you certainly can't. Yeah. They all can't be adopted. But at the very least, by having the conversation with the student and then giving them some sort of relief or release, it could it could change the culture of it all. It could. It could, yeah. right? I mean, and it seems like the responsible and ethical thing to do. But if you've been a social worker for 20 years and you're just trying to get to the end of your career, do you want to deal with this crap? I would hope that answer is absolutely yes. <laughs> of course. Yeah. yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> yeah. Oops. <laughs> yeah, neglect is another way of, of uh, just coping with it. You know, you just let mm-hmm. it go. Don't look at it. And because kids are so full of issues, 
Uh, you can spend your whole time dealing with their issues, which is what happened to me. Yeah. You know, uh, Right, so we'll move away from that story. Okay. Um, I did. I did report her. Technical uh, issue there. Yes. Got her some help. Okay. Not much, but they ended up. She ended up in therapy at a crisis center. Okay. Good. Um, I suppose you can't count on everyone to always do their best, especially. Yeah. She she tried after that story. After that story, she uh, uh, used a pair of scissors and stabbed the shop teacher. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Uh, so they got her out of the school because she was no longer uh, able to contain herself. Uh, she told me she brought the scissors to my class, too, but um, felt she couldn't. Uh, she's an adult raising three kids now, and we're friends, but yeah, um, on Facebook, you know, but... Um, yeah. Yeah. Tough time in her life. Absolutely. Yeah. <sighs> okay. So you've heard some of my worst stories. I hope that's not going to make this a lousy tape. No, um, I think um, so. Contrary to what you might think, I think it makes for a better conversation, a more, a okay. more intriguing and interesting conversation. Okay. And I still think that teaching is one of the best things that I could do. I'm not always sure that it's public school or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I have a daughter who teaches in a private school and I've suggested, even though the money isn't as good, that she stay there because she's got a sports system that's worth staying with. Certainly. Uh, she has a principal who loves her, and, uh, staff who adore her, and she want, she making probably 10000 less than she could if she were at the public school in the same town. Sure. And uh, and she's had job offers. And I kept saying, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. you, know, you get to teach children in a public school. You get to teach skills. And I think there's a big difference. Certainly, yeah. So. Yeah, that's, I mean, sometimes the money is not the most important thing, especially if it's right. something you're doing day in, day out, and have to spend time with these people. That's your life. Yes, and you said you should make your life fun, something mm -hmm. worth doing. Absolutely. Your job should be something you like. Because my job took me all over the state, it included, you know, new, new terrain, so I never had to give up. I worked my most, longest I worked on the same job was seven years prior to coming to St. Xavier. Eight years. Oh, wow. Eight mm -hmm. years. And that was teaching in Lincoln. Right. Other than that, I've been truck driver and you know, done everything under the sun. Yeah, gardener, caretaker, you know, host. Uh, yeah, all kinds of things. Yeah. Uh, I think maybe I'm wrong, but it seems again people who feel compelled to these sort of roles in careers find themselves doing lots of things in support intrinsically to them. You yes. know, whether it be whatever it is to pay the bills. And I think that I knew very early on that I wanted to get a PhD. The problem was sort of how could I fit it in my life and what kind of a degree was I looking for? Because everything's fascinating to me. I All love right. history. Mm -hmm. um, but I, it seemed somehow separate from what I was doing with life. When I got to curriculum with Schubert, mm -hmm. It was, um, it was kind of like coming home. It was, how do you teach? What do you teach? Why do you teach it? Mm -hmm. Questions that I've been asking myself for years, but that's what study of curriculum is. Right. So, um, when the state came out with the guidelines that you have to teach this, this, and this, we we had somebody come in as an outside evaluator to UIC and. My chair said, what made your people the authority on what to teach? Right. What you teach it comes from your students. It depends on who they are. Right. And he got in trouble. <laughs> hmm. I mean, he's not wrong, though. That's how you should 
Yeah, you're lucky because art doesn't have the requirements in some ways. You know, you're actually exploring with kids. Yeah. I, you know, I went to a school, because I, I do two years at a school, I get pretty familiar with the schools. And there was this one school where the art teacher was the leader of the school. Interesting. Uh, it was an elementary school. Mm-hmm. And the walls were packed with student art. Yeah. And there were all kinds of beautiful artwork, sculptures, uh, drawings, ceramics, all, all sorts of things. But the teachers all would say, this is what I have to teach. Can you help? And she would figure out how the curriculum of art could fit the needs of the community, if you will. Right. And do it that way. I love that idea because art has been my my way to learn all these other things. It wasn't until I started to learn history from the art history perspective that I truly began to connect the dots about what was actually going on in history because it's not necessarily you're reading a story about Napoleon or whatever, you know, but then you look at a painting and you you realize that, okay, this is the French Revolution here. This is how it's being depicted. This is what people were feeling. And so it's a, it's a better connection to what history has than just reading about the events. Absolutely. The events of history. Uh, There used to be a fellow here, um, who taught humanities, Mm -hmm. um, and he taught history of, in humanities through the arts of the period and the arts of the country. He was very interested in Indian and Buddhist art and taught a lot of that. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, he passed with cancer, but uh, he was the most alive faculty member I knew. Uh, even when he was dying of cancer, he still taught until the week before he passed. Um, and he was just enthusiastic about everything he did. And yeah. he was just full of life. That's amazing. Yeah. I love that sort of passion, you know. It makes yeah. it easy to learn when an instructor is just glowing and gleaming with yeah. the knowledge they want to share. Yeah. You know, it's that's something that, again, in the couple of lessons I've taught, I've learned the trick to let students watch me learn something. So cool. if I, whatever it might be, Whatever it might be, you know, depending on where we're going to fit it in. Like, I just make sure that I pull something up that I didn't know and just have them watch me learn something. I thought that was kind of what this art teacher was doing. What is the curriculum you're teaching? How can I weave it into what I'm doing with the art? Mm -hmm. What new things can I do that would, you know, would supplement or... So her curriculum changed every year based on kind of what the students were doing and who the students were. And it was, she was very alive and very much part of the school community. And um, the building was gorgeous because it had, you know, art everywhere. Yeah. Uh, not just in a display case in the basement. Just, yeah. <laughs> Sculpture, painting, everything. Yeah. 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 It was That's just, amazing. What school was this? It's in... Um, Morton Grove, I think. Martin Grove. It's on York Road. Is this teacher still teaching? Or she's there retired? I, I, I don't know. What was her what name? Was I don't know. You don't remember? Didn't okay. know her. Yeah. Oh, you didn't know her. Okay. No, I just knew that I, I was teaching in oh. the school building. And, okay, yeah. And asked, you know, about what's going on here? Yeah. Why is this place so vibrant? That was a public school? Yeah. How did they get so lucky to change their curriculums in that way? Uh, it, again, it's a school of financial comfort. Okay. So um, they could, they had fewer. If you don't need the state money, you can just say, never mind, I don't right. want to bother with that. And they uh, don't have to bother. Yeah. Uh, when I did Facing History, I think I told you about that. Facing History is the Holocaust stories. Mm-hmm. I, I learned it by being sent to uh, Facing History in ourselves. And I, it was all new. Mm-hmm. And I was trying to teach Holocaust education. And by the way, as a history major, I made it through my master's degree without knowing there was a Holocaust. So it was like, what? what oh, my God, how did I get there? <laughs> <laughs> it just never came up, right? Interesting, yeah. Not, not in high school, not anywhere. 
So Illinois has a law that you have to teach it at some level, uh, junior high and above, I think. I think I have to have a year of Holocaust education or something like that. Yeah, I don't remember when in school I learned it, but I feel like I sort of always have known. I don't know. Have you ever seen the movie Life is Beautiful? No. It's an amazing movie, um, Italian film. Okay. When I, was, when I was very young, I used to call it The Little Boy Who Won the Tank because I didn't know what it was actually called. But um, it's a movie where a Jewish man uh, sweeps this young Italian woman off her feet and they fall madly in love. She's, you know, from a higher echelon of society. Mm-hmm. And uh, they end up living in his uh, bookshop. Okay. And, but then World War II happens and they start rounding, rounding up Jewish people. Mm-hmm. And they all, the, the son and the father get taken away to the concentration camp. The, the wife volunteers to go because she can't bear being away from her yeah. family. And I forget the actor's name. Mm, he's an Italian actor. Okay. But um, he, he lies to his son and he says, this is a game. Oh, I've, heard, I've heard about this movie. I did, it wasn't out when I was teaching it. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I know. So he, and he makes the world a yeah. magic place. Right. Yeah. And so he's, he tells him he has to hide. We're collecting points, and at the end, we're going to win a tank. And, uh, <laughs> and so the movie, very poetically, the father dies. Eventually, he gets killed protecting his son. And um, it's, you know, around the time, in the story anyway, when um, the Americans are, this is in Poland. I think they get ch- trained to Poland. So the Americans are coming in and to save the day sort of thing. And um, everybody leaves. Everyone who had been hiding leaves. The boy's still hidden away. And then the next morning he comes out and he's lost. And he assumes he's won. And then the Americans come around the corner in a tank and oh. pick him up. And it's it's very sad movie, but very beautiful as well. Yeah. It's a very good representation. Well, a dramatized representation of what? Sure. World War II was. When, um, when I taught Holocaust education, because I was working with Facing History in Ourselves, uh, we had somebody who um, liberated Birkenau uh, come and speak to us. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, and I, I, my program got tighter and tighter. I, got, I started with 23 days, and I built it up to about 40 days of coursework. Um, getting the kids to do an art project at the end, which was wonderful. Yeah. Um, it was a community that was about 30% uh, Jewish, the Lincoln community at that time. Mm-hmm. And they paid for me to get, learn how to teach it. And I ended up being in the Tribune and, oh, really? and, and being on WGN and you know all that kind of stuff as sure. a result of teaching it because I, I loved teaching it. I was very involved in it. So one day they asked me if I would mind bringing Eileen Weisel with me to class. And he came, he sat with me in the car. We drove, I drove and picked him up at the airport. And oh, wow. Came to class, talked to my students, and then I took him to the center in town where, uh, where he was going to present to a larger group. Wow. And so it was just fun. So yeah. I had this kid, uh, Hentoff, last name of Hentoff, I think. Not quite sure. Anyhow, he went to Northwestern to the journalism school, and he wrote a story about meeting Eileen Weisel in my class, and it won him some award. Really? And, and Hoffman is the last name. Can't pull the first name up right now. Mm-hmm. Donnie, Ronnie, something like that. Anyhow, he's currently in um, Ukraine. Reporting, really? Reporting on. Wow. What's going on there? Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Just learned on Facebook that he was in Ukraine. Wow. He sent me word. Very good. Yeah. That's uh that's beautiful. Yeah. That he's using still that same lesson. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, it was amazing. He, he interviewed me once and wrote that up and interviewed Hadley Weisel once and wrote that up. Very cool. So, cuz his family was connected to it. So, it was cool. He's a really cool kid. And all my kids were really cool kids. It's very hard to think of any that weren't. 
you're among them. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah. Um, so we've talked about a lot. We've talked about a great many things here. Yes. Um, I don't know if you got my philosophy out of any of this. But. I think it's in there. Okay. It's in there, <laughs> definitely. It's cooked in. Um, I think we should probably wrap it up because it's about four hours. And if I want, <laughs> we, we want someone to listen to this, you know, it's going to take them a couple of sittings. But I should just tell you that I'm so grateful to have met you and had you as an instructor, especially because we only spent a few weeks together. Yep. Because right when classes started, it was just the very beginning of the pandemic. Yep. So a lot of our interfacing was just through the through the text and through your emails. We had maybe five, six, seven weeks of face to face a face to face class, yeah. but it's it stuck with me more so than any course. And uh, it was a cool little group too. It was a cool group. Um, I'm still close to a couple people we had in class. A couple of them are on Facebook for me. Oh really? Yeah. Do you still talk with Zineb? Yes. She's great. She's yeah. she's another art major. She just did her student teaching this semester. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, she's great. I'm going to interview her, her soon. Give her my best, will you? Yeah, I certainly will. She doesn't know it yet, but I'm going to interview her soon as well. I think that's excellent. Yeah. yeah. So I'm excited for that. But um, I must thank you for just being such a sincere and genuine voice and poking at us and giving us the space to grow and learn because it has certainly changed my trajectory and I know that it has changed the a few, a few others a few others probably hundreds of others that okay. you've influenced so um, just thank you so much Dr. Hilton for this, this. Was, this has been a pleasure it's fun to talk to you thank you so uh, much and it's uh, it's rewarding that you remember my class fondly and, and that uh, you thought to do this with me so thank you I appreciate it very much yeah okay, okay. All right, thanks again. Yeah. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>